I have put a thousand hours into this game and I can tell you for a fact the developers have dicks big enough to just put the entire frame on the developer update bugs, bots, and bans. There's very few teams that would do that. Whenever I was saying that the game was bad and it had a million problems in beta, everybody was shitting on me. The game comes out and I get hate by everybody only to wait for two more weeks or a month later for everyone to get to where I was at in the first week and complain about the same fucking thing. And now, now they're actually making improvements and people don't see it. Stop thinking for yourself and just listen to me. Okay, yesterday, the New World developer team put out a one and a half hour video detailing kind of what they feel is the direction of the game, where the game's going, what's gonna happen, etc. Uh, we are going to watch, that's right, the entire one and a half hour video. We're gonna watch the whole thing. So saddle up, get a drink, get your soda, get your snackies, because we're going to work. Let's take a look at it. Here we go. Where's the sound? Hi everybody, my name's Greg Henniger. I'm a member of the community team here at Amazon Games. And we've been scouring the internet, you know, listening to your feedback, reading the forums, looking on social media, Reddit, all of these places. And, you know, we decided it was time for a developer Good. update okay. video. So to help me do that, I'm gonna have a host of a lot of the New World developers. But first and foremost, I have Scott Lane, the game director, and okay. Rich Lawrence, the studio head here at the Irvine Studio. Hey, before we start, I just wanted to uh, call out the players and say thank you. Um, the engagement from the player base has been humbling, and it's, it's really helped us guide where we're going. So I just want to say how much we appreciate the feedback and how constructive it's been. And, you know, we, we like partnering with the players a lot. So we're excited. Today is in response to the players that have been asking us, hey, we want to know more about where you're going. We want to go deep on some of these topics. So. So today is all about that. It's responding to that. Right. Yep. Yeah. I think this is already good. Uh, I mean, I don't know why people like the thing is that the caps and everything like that's like, what did you expect them to say? Like, I feel like that's the bet. This is a best case scenario statement. Yeah. Like, what was he supposed to like? Yeah, that's a best case scenario statement. Like, what else would he say? But are they going to acknowledge dumbass bugs? Well, we're going to find out. Apologize first? Well, I'm sure they're they're sorry to an extent. I don't know what they're going to say. Uh, I don't know about apologizing if, if that's the right way to do it. Uh, I, I don't think that's what I would do either. Yeah, okay, let's go. Uh, I've talked to Greg before. He's actually been really cool with me, and uh, he's helped me out with like a couple of things too with the game. So, uh, yeah, I, I know at least he's cool. Uh, I haven't really ever talked to either of these guys before, though. Okay, here we go. And right at the top, um, you know, uh, something that a lot of players are talking about right now, they're very concerned about, and they would like a little bit more information. You know, as we've been updating the game recently with our, you know, game updates and patches, there seems to be an introduction of more new issues while we're trying to fix other game issues. Uh, can you talk a little bit about... <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> Yeah, 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 it is. It is what it is. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh my god. Um, how we're going to work to prevent <laughs> some of that? Yeah, that has been a problem. We've introduced True. some new issues with some of the patches we've made. We've done 19 patches since release, which is kind of a blistering pace. What we've been trying to do is balance uh, new features as much as we can in with our fixes. And what we've discovered is that we have a rate limit, like, we, like we're going too fast, honestly. Um, and so we're going to focus a lot on better testing, longer testing, making sure that we've got something fully ready for, for release. It's not like we weren't doing that before, but we've learned some things. that. We're well, I think the problem is that they wanted to release, like there were a few like updates that they did that they didn't put them in the patch notes at all. And then they just brought them out straight to live servers. And that's what was really fucking annoying. Like, more than anything else, it was really fucking annoying that they would have these, uh, th these changes and stuff like this that were just put through. And I think that they put the changes through because they wanted to have universally positive press for the patches. 
So they didn't want to bring up any of the bad things that the game's going to have in it that are just to extend playtime or to make people interface with systems that they wouldn't more regularly interface with. So I think that's kind of what happened. So hopefully they need to cut that out, and then I think that that'll be the case for sure. Gen Ghost uh, changes, that surprised yeah. us. Uh, and given that, we're going to change our process. Uh, we're going to focus on a few less features, but deeper mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how we express them. That's uh, good. Make those features bigger uh, and, and deliver them to players with less bugs. Um, you know, that's, that's going to be the, the desired outcome. That's our focus, yeah. actually. Yeah, can I add on to that just a little? Yeah, yeah, of so, course. So with our weeklies, you know, in general, you want to fix eight to 10, maybe even 15 things a week problems, and you want to make them really targeted. But when we were watching the game live, we saw problems that were bothering us, and, it, and it's like, a, it just hurts in your stomach when you see players struggling mm -hmm. with things. So we were trying to get 50, 60 things fixed a week, and that left us, you know, not enough testing, and, and it was, we, like, like Rich said, we were trying to go too fast. We were trying to fix more than we could. Yeah, they, so they're probably understaffed or something, right? Or they don't have the amount of people that they need to have. I, I, th I think that's really what it comes down to, is that they probably don't have the amount of people that they need to solve all the problems, because New World is a complex game in a lot of ways, and because it's so complex, it has all these like interchangeable social systems that cascade into each other, that like if one thing goes wrong then everything else goes wrong together. Now, Amazon Game Studios is not necessarily Amazon. Uh, it's fun to meme about it being a trillion dollar company and them fucking it up, etc. But the truth is that this the game studio itself doesn't have the full funding of the entire company. Like, that's, that's just the truth. Uh, and uh, yeah, they only do so much for the studio, exactly created more problems than it's worth and we're learning from that and we're you know and changing our processes improving every day so yeah do you feel like the uh introduction of the the ptr the public test realm is going to help in that direction too yeah absolutely um yeah uh, one it gives players the thing is like they need to if they if they're going to do a ptr they need to have all of the changes on the ptr like no more of the surprise surprise it's not going to work anymore bitch like what the fuck are you kidding me, man? Like, they've got to get rid of those. Like, just bring out the PTR and have the changes on a PTR, get the feedback ahead of time. Because that's what I think most people got upset about. Is, like, even if they're going to make a bad change, knowing that it's going to happen is, like, like, for example, the expertise change. And how, like, gear that you bought previously with the expertise change isn't affected by expertise. That is something that's really important to state off the bat. That's something that's really important to know off the bat. And that way you don't push it live and then fuck everybody over and it's a huge drama fest. So they did actually bring out some of the negatives with the expertise system on PTR. And because of that, the system was better than if they didn't. Great way to, to see a feature before it's complete. Yeah. Right? Like have input on it. Um, and we're, we're looking at creating longer cycles for PTR. So there's more time to mm -hmm. do that. You know, get. Yeah, unfortunately, when those features start with a longer cycle, they're going to be really raw when they first come out. But I think players understand that. You know, they, they get that it's uh, very new at that point. Um, that gives them more time to feedback on it, more time for us to ingest that feedback, like figure out what we can do with it, improve the feature based on it. Um, and you'll see us using PTR continuously, basically, going forward for, uh, for all Good. major new features. Last thing we want to do is surprise people with a new feature that's impactful to gameplay and they haven't had a chance to give us their expertise and saying, this is good, this is bad, you know. The yeah, we don't want to have that happen. That would be terrible if something like that happened. These are the aspects we like, these yeah. are the aspects we don't. Yeah, even further, like on the November release, we didn't really have a chance to respond to what the players told us were the problems. Mm -hmm. On the December release, you're going to see that we actually were able to respond to a significant number and we're going to, like Rich said, we're going to edit That's more. true. Uh, the they did make a lot of changes and improvements on the expertise system through feedback from the PTR. Yeah, they actually that that that's actually true. Uh, like for example, like the gear score not automatically going down. Uh, there's a number of things that they have done. So I I feel like this is not completely just empty words. Why why are there kappas? That's what happened. Yeah, like I'm, I, yeah, I'm just I'm saying that like yeah, that, 
that that's actually what happened though like i i, I will be the first person listen you guys are are like just listen stop thinking for yourself and just listen to me okay Whenever I was saying that the game was bad and it had a million problems in beta, everybody was shitting on me and telling me that I was fucking wrong. The game comes out and I completely shit on the fucking game and I get hate by everybody only to wait for two more weeks or a month later for everyone to get to where I was at in the first week and complain about the same fucking thing. And now, now they're actually making improvements and people don't see it. Just listen to what I... Listen, li listen. Okay, I've been right every time with the game. Maybe I'll be wrong here. But I've been fucking right. More time for January and going... Here we go. And so is the... Would you say that the best place to provide feedback if you're a player uh, would be the forums or social or... I mean, we, I, we, we look at a lot of different places... Yeah, um, but where where's the best place to get feedback? It's the forums for sure. Okay. Um, we look at Reddit, we look at the forums, we look at other places. We even watch in-game chat. But the team scours the forums daily, and we have internal communication networks that we use. And I would say I see twenty to thirty forum posts shared with specific team members there a day at a minimum, mm -hmm. where we're raising awareness of things, getting them added to lists, and that helps drive our priorities. Yeah. We, we so you got to go to the forums. I mean, that kind of makes sense because like they can control the forums in, in a way. So like, there's going to be people who will type like crazy, stupid shit, and it's easier to control that on on a platform that you you have control on. Uh, no, people control the forums. If they can delete a thread, they control the forums. Let's be honest control the narrative i think it's like yeah it to i mean yes if you want to look at it in the most uh like negative or cynical way yeah they control the narrative on the forums but i think it's more to just kind of have a place where they do kind of control like some of the crazy people well, apparently they haven't been but uh i think that's why it's because it's a platform that they they understand touched on this a little bit earlier, but is the team prioritizing bug fixes and polish right now over new content or? It's, it's, it's a little of both, but the number one driver of priority is what has the biggest impact on the player. Mm -hmm. So if we have a serious- Oh, that's such bullshit. What, what do you mean, man? Like it, 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 that's such bullshit. Like there have been massive problems in the game, like especially on release. Get the fuck out of here. Like, what about the fact that tuning orbs are 10,000 gold? Like, you have to spend 10,000 gold to play the end game activities. Why? Uh, get the fuck... Like, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm sorry, but it's just... It's not... Like, I, maybe this is, like, their vision. But my vision of a good game is not having to farm all fucking day to do a dungeon. I just want to do the dungeon. bug and a serious feature the bug is probably going to take priority because that is going to impact more players sure um we have a pretty large team so we have some features that we feel are really important that we're going to be talking about today we keep we want to keep you know people working on those but not at the expense of a bad experience in live so live is always it's always it's always our number one driver right now mm -hmm. but yeah look the way i see it is that i don't think that there's anything that's going to convince me that they did not really give a fuck about this going into the game release. Like, the release of this game was an embarrassment. It was like the Azoth staff didn't work. You couldn't do Outpost Rush. Uh, the 65 portals, well, I guess that's the Azoth staff as well. Um, let, let's see, there was like two zones that you could do, period. There is a million fucking problems with the game, and there is so much content that you just literally could not do. So, I think that's a big problem. Yeah, PvP was completely broken. Yeah, for sure. So, like, going forward, if this is what they're going to say, we'll hold them to it. But this was not what they did on launch.
PP was trash. Yeah. Isn't there uh, intention to grab money quick then doesn't care at all when released? Uh, no, because like if you don't have people playing the game, you can't sell microtransactions. You, you have to have people playing the game. But new features are important too, so it's a, it's a balancing act and we, yeah, we don't have a hard rule. Every bug is more important than every feature or vice versa. It's really looking at it holistically and then dry, drilling down to, you know, this versus this. That, that being said, I mean, the takeaway should be we, we, are, we are prioritizing bugs. We try to figure, because we consider those larger impact to players. Mm -hmm. um, once we deal with those bugs and they aren't larger impact, then we're looking at features. But people should understand that only so many people can be productive in fixing a given bug, right? So if we have a bug... I have a guy who uh, works in game dev. Uh, he actually, he knows people at the New World, uh, at, at the New World uh, studio. And he uh, he said that they are being worked down to the bone, so they're getting their ass like they're, they're they're getting their ass beat. Like they're having to work constantly, probably like eight to twelve hours a day, m like six seven days a week. Like that's what I've heard is that the New World Game Studio team is just getting fucking like farmed because of how hard and like how how many problems new world has that's not good no it, it's not good uh, obviously like the game had a lot of problems but it, it it's the thing is like if the game is bad you can just not play the game i don't think you should really expect people to like ruin their their health to make the game good but at the same time you should expect the game good to, to be good too so it's it's always a decision like is it good enough for me to play right now yes or no and if the answer is no just don't play the game uh, i think that's what's simple that's on poor management then yeah i would say so uh yeah probably bad management bad priorities a uh, number of things like that you're right doesn't releasing a game in a polished state uh equate the amount of bugs to deal with post-launch yeah i think so but they had already, you guys need to remember, like, they delayed New World for an entire year. So, of course, they're not going to want to go and delay it again. Because then people, it, it'll be like a Star Citizen situation or Duke Nukem Forever. So that's why they didn't want to keep delaying it. Yeah, as it a makes priority, sense. We put our best people on it. You know, like, we give out every resource it needs. We're not holding back. But many times there'll be people who otherwise wouldn't have anything to do. And they I mean, you got to remember, like, if you go back... And you look at the New World game director, like the, the guy with the long hair, he's got like the same hair basically that I do. Um, if you look at his hair a year and a half ago, a lot more of it was not gray and white. This guy's been getting his ass worked off. Like it's the same fucking thing. Show us. Yeah, I've got, I've got to find a picture. What was the guy's name? On features while others are working on the bug. Right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, what was the guy's name? That's the difference of one year. All right, one year. This guy's been getting his ass worked. Okay, yeah, yeah, like, let, let's be honest. Not good. Is there, um, speaking of things we're working on right now, uh, server merges. Can you talk a little bit about server merges, how they work, how they're going to kind of look to players? Yeah, the idea with a server merge is, um, well, the, the primary pursuit of a server merge is important to note, which is to give it's a better play work, yeah. to players. Uh, we find, like, we have all kinds of indicators, but the number one is just play satisfaction. Players like being on a server that has a, a wide and diverse yeah. audience playing it. Right? 100%. So, um, that's True. the objective with server mergers. What happens with a server merger is there's a host that you're going to, the server that we're moving to, and then one to uh, you know, uh, any number of servers may merge into that server. And all of the players transfer. Um, there are steps taken to make sure that, for instance, companies get compensation if they're, you know, if they're changes uh, going to a new server. I think they fucked this up, where like if a company owned a, uh, a territory, they got 50K, but if you own two territories, you still got 50K. So I, I, I heard they fucked this up, but I'm not sure. That, And then you land on the new map, which is the map from the existing host server. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what's interesting is like immediately a bunch of wars break out because, you know, everyone's like, yeah, let's resettle right. it, which is actually kind of cool. Um, 
But the, the number one objective there is make sure there's no loss. Like, you know, nobody like loses anything. There's no gold cost or anything yeah. to that. Um, obviously, nothing on your character gets lost. Nothing reverts. Um, but you just have more people to play with. So Except more opportunities here. for PvP, more opportunities for PvE. You can go into dungeons. You can easier find a group uh, when there's more people on the server. What 100%. we target with the merger is not to fill a server completely to capacity, but to make it a very healthy full day cycle. So even at its low ebb, it's easy to, for instance, find a dungeon group. That, you know, that's, that's our primary motivation, is make it easy for players to find social organization. PvP or PvE, either way. That's okay. good. Great, that all sounds awesome. We're gonna continue to talk about you know, new features coming. Uh, we're gonna talk about, um, gosh, uh, mutators were one thing. We're talking about the roadmap. We're gonna talk about vision. Mutators, as far as I know, is Mythic Plus. That's basically what it is for New World, so uh, we have a, a full show coming up, so we hope you stick around. New year, new world, new you, new dudes. For the next dudes. segment, uh, we're going to be talking about the vision and the future of New World. So mm -hmm. we have some new people at the table. We have Dave Verifayi, who is the creative director and the art director. Uh, Charles this guy must be new. His hair's not gray. Charles Bradbury. So, Scott, I think this is a kind of a big question right what is the vision for new world what are we gonna see? yeah the age is here this guy's 25 this guy's 18 this guy's 21 okay and uh yeah this is <laughs> this is what working on new world for a year does to you okay no i'm telling you guys like it's it, it's no joke you gotta work your ass off playing this game yeah he's out of college well no he it's his internship <laughs> yeah they're working people's asses off in the future so at the highest level the vision is that we wanted to create a world where pvp and pde players wouldn't just coexist but they'd complement each other so far you can see things like our territory mechanics supporting that mm -hmm. although we do have a little work to do there we still want to figure out a way to give players a way to overthrow tyrants or absent leaders uh -huh. um, but i yeah. think one of the big things we should touch on is that between PvP and PvE, we plan on supporting both. We don't have a favorite child in this one. We think both are hugely important to the longevity of New World. I agree. We still have a lot of story to tell about. You know, there's a lot more things we want to talk about on a turn. Well, you've got to do cinematics, man. Like, nobody's going to sit around. Like, it's like you have a, a, a three-sentence quest, and only the first line is voice acted. Are you kidding me? Come on. Like, let, let's, let's get this done. The thing is, like, the New World, in my opinion, I think the first cinematic of New World where he goes in and he talks to the, uh, the corrupted priest who gives him the box and then he's sailing, that, that uh, cinematic is fucking amazing. It's great. Like, it, it completely sets up the story. It makes sense. It builds the character into the cinematic itself. It's fucking flawless. It is a great cinematic, 100p, on a stack, Skrilla Skrilla, for real, for real, 100. Like, yes, it is so good. Make more of those. We need more cinematics. We need a cinematic at the end of the dungeon. We need a cinematic for the different big quest parts. Yeah. Um, more threats, more villains coming through. We still have to close this chapter on the Isabella story. Mm -hmm. We have, um, we, we want more dynamic things happening in the world. We'd Let me ask that. you guys, for those of you who plays, to play New World, like if you don't play New World, it doesn't matter. But if you, if you play New World, do you know who Isabella even is? The bad girl. Yeah. She's the bad girl that you fight in Dynasty Shipyard who runs away after uh, she sends, she, she, she's like six the dogs on you. That's it. Yeah, the, the crazy flying pirate girl. Exactly. Sylvanas. So, like, you don't even really know who that is. World, parts of the world feel different every time you come through it. I think that's awesome. We've heard the players loud and clear. They want more variety in AI. They want more variety in questing, more things to do. True. We're definitely going to lean into that hard. True. We have these intersecting game systems that live in the sandbox. We want to put more of that into play. We think that's really important. So, and like I said, we just we want to finish telling this story. There's so much more to uncover in the tournament that we think is important. And when we, you've got to tell the story in a better way. 
it's not that the story is bad. The story, I don't think that the story, the fundamental of the story, that coming to America, there's like this corrupting force that has been corrupting people for thousands of years, and you have all the different races that have been, or uh, cultures, whatever you want to call them, that have been corrupted by this over the years. The idea of the story is really good. You have the recipe for a good story. It's just you're using the wrong ingredients. That's it. Or you're, you're stirring it wrong. You see what I'm saying? Think about all this in the long term. It's going to be guided by the players. What are they asking for? What do they want? How are they reacting to new things? Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is like, I can't give you an exact order, but these are the direction we're pushing the game in over time. Right. And you're saying you wanted to kind of finish a story that's really the, the story of Isabella and then tell new stories or continue the, the mystery that is Eternum? Well, there's a lot of new stories we want to tell, you know, yeah. and, and we're going to hint on some of those today. We're not going to get specific. We're not ready to talk about them, but we have... There's a lot more um, interesting people on this world than just Isabella. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll dive into that later uh, with some of the other dev members. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, I think when I think about New World, some of the things that are special to me about it are how players can change the world. Like, people can actually have an impact on the world and change it. And I think that's something we want to continue to foster. Uh, I, I like that a lot. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Dave. Very good insight. It's like if you cut down a tree... And then everywhere else... Now, he's the creative director. He's not the intern, right? I was goofing around. He's the creative director of the game. So I'm glad that the creative director of the game has an opinion that I agree with. Okay? So, like, you cut down a tree. That tree's cut down in the world for a while. Uh, if you uh, cut them, break a mine, that mine is gone there. Now, I would like to see more of that. I would like to see more control that players can visually make in the world. Can't see his info. It says uh, Dave uh, Verfali, creative director. This is the creative director of the game. Build as we continue to grow the vision of the game. Uh, that and like you mentioned the dynamic events. I think those are big and we've got some really yeah. cool ones with the corrupted breaches uh, and players can see those dynamically sprouting up. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I could see us adding more of those and maybe even some that affect PVP in the future, right? Because I think that the world changing each time you play is pretty cool. Yeah, and you touched on that earlier, the, the, the balance between PvP and PvE. Um, I would imagine that is you know, something we're going to continue to invest in moving forward. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, like Scott said, we don't have a favorite child here, right, Scott? We like them <laughs> both. Uh, and I think we've got really cool content for both sides. Like on the PvE side, uh, you know, we've got more expeditions coming. Uh, we have this great, great winter event that is oh, happening. Right. The winter convergence uh, event. Winter yeah. convergence, and more of that is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the PvP side, right, I think we've got really cool large-scale PvP moments with war. It's like one of our best moments, big and dynamic. You've yeah. got to fix the lag, man. Like, y'all have to fix the lag. Like, PvP is really cool in this game. I remember whenever I did the war in beta, it was actually really cool. But, like, I've watched videos. Like, it's been fixed. Lag is actually fixed. Like, they actually fixed lag. Like, no no joke. It's actually fixed. Hmm. It's better. It has to be pretty close to perfect, in my opinion. Yeah, in my opinion, I think it has to be really close to perfect in order for it to be acceptable. So I, I haven't played it myself. I'm not sure. I think our combat but good. really shines at the small scale also. So I think we want to start supporting Arena. that smaller scale in PvP. Arena. Also. Awesome. Yeah. I know there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of community members and players that you know are excited about that small scale um, small scale PvP stuff. Yeah. You know, and I talked a bit, or me and both Dave and I talked a bit about the the vision forward. Art has its own vision forward, and I'd love it if Charles would share yes, some of that. Yes. Absolutely. I think. We've laid this pretty good foundation. There's, there's a lot of variety to the world. There's all these different enemy groups, the lost and the corrupted and stuff. We want to keep building on that. We have a lot of ideas of like new cultures that can come to the world and sort of spread out across our landscape. And 
they bring their own culture and look and feel with them. Mm -hmm. And so new outfits, new architecture for players to explore, new enemy families that players are going to have to deal with. And so I think as we grow a tournament, like, flesh out what this world is, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to like make the world more interesting. Do you think those new um, new enemy types and new areas um, are going to be the places where we're going to see like the brand new stuff, or are we going to continue to refresh you know, the, the zones that, um, that people have been playing in already? I think it's going to be a bit of both. We talk a lot about like this dynamic world. Things so we're getting new zones. That's good. I think good. we want to see stuff in the areas that players are familiar with start to shift and change, but also adding new zones and new areas that players can go to and like find new adventures as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can tell it was just a bunch of dudes decorating this set. Uh, yeah, bro. Uh, so uh, why don't we put a gun on the table? Oh, that's a good idea, bro. Why don't we put a sword on top of the gun? Oh, man. That's a good idea. What if we put another sword behind you, too? And then, oh, what about a little sword, though? Okay, all right, all right, yeah. We'll put that one over there. And a shield to block the swords. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is totally, as I said, this is a, uh, it's, it's a man's game, okay? <laughs> At least it was a, probably a dude setting this up. Yeah, I think it's great, okay? Yeah, it's totally fine. I think it's just so exciting that we're celebrating these different cultures and to be able to go over here mm -hmm. to this culture because you want to craft something or something unique to them or go over to this part of the world. It drives this this desire to explore the world and it keeps making it feel different, you know. And to your earlier question, I think it's hugely important that while we are growing the world, this current world is alive. Mm -hmm. It's changing and it's going to be different over time. Right. Good. And we, we kind of talked about the vision for the future, but... In terms of a tangible roadmap, is there anything you can share with us today? Yeah, we're going to go pretty deep on some of this stuff, so I'll just give you a quick high level. But Great. You know, we just released our first event, and we're in the process of releasing it, mm -hmm. um, which we're really excited about, the Winter Convergence event. We have something coming out in January, Mutators. This is, this is where when you're playing expeditions at the end of the game, they're going to play a little differently, they're going to get a little harder, and they're going to have better rewards the more times you do them. So it's going to create a repeatable loop. Yeah, we'll deep dive into that later. Yeah. Really deep dive into that. Uh, after that, we want to spend a That's little... cool, but, like, man, I don't want to just do uh, Genesis over and over, man. Like, I don't, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I want new dungeons that are harder. Like, the Mutators, that's nice, but, like, I, I like the idea that there's a harder dungeon, and the harder dungeon gives better gear. Like, it, on, on a baseline of difficulty. A little time getting rid of some of the bug debt that we've accrued. Um, so we're going to focus on fixing as many bugs. We're going to dive really deep into the balance. We're, we fix balance regularly, weekly and monthly. But we're going to devote February to bugs, balance, and bots. Because we've heard players, you know, they're frustrated with, with some of these things. And we yeah. want to fix those. We want to make it better. Good. And we'll talk more about that later. And we're going to go too. deep yeah. on that, too. We're yeah. not going to go deep on this next one, but we have mentioned that we want to, we do want to close this chapter in Isabella's story, and we want to close it in a really cool way. Mm -hmm. And that's something a little further down the line that we can't wait to share with players. Yeah. And I just want to add, like, this is sort of the roadmap we've laid out, but we're always listening to what players want and adjusting. And I think we saw a little bit of that with the expertise and gypsum, the end game changes we made. Like yeah. we heard, there were... There was some room for improvement, mm -hmm. and we're always open to sort of interject things into the roadmap when we hear concerns from people. Yeah, awesome. So uh, that's kind of the the vision in the future of where we're going. We're going to spend the rest of the show. Uh, that, that's important to know about because, like, the fact is that uh, with like the expertise system and shit like that, if they just work with the players, they can give the people what they want. So being dynamic but having your own vision at the same time. This is, in my opinion, the ideal outcome. This is what you want to have them say. Diving on a lot of these topics with um, other developers who solely focus on those things. Uh, so it's going to be exciting. Bugs, bots, and bans. All right, so this next segment is going to be bugs. The, the fact is, like, this is why I said before, this is why I've been relatively positive about new world regardless of it being uh admittedly a complete shit show is that the developers have dicks big enough to just put the entire frame 
on the developer update bugs bots and bans there's very few teams that would do that they would make excuses they would be like oh well you know it is what it is or whatever like they just they're they're just saying it I, i'm glad yeah thank god All right, so this next segment is going to be bugs, exploits, dupes, and bans. You know it. We have I know some it. New people here at the table. Everybody knows it. Katie Krasinski. Krasinski. Okay. I like Krasinski. that. It's like the uh, the it's cooler like, version of, of Katie. John Krasinski says. <laughs> I know it's better than the Unabomber, which is <laughs> the, the one that people usually get my last name right. Katie Krasinski, you are the senior producer. We also have Scott Geyser, who's a gameplay engineer. Okay. And we have already introduced Rich, so we don't need to do that again. But I will ask you the first question, Rich. Sure. Um, there are a lot of uh, questions about how the ban system works um, within New World. Yeah, you true. Know. Can you can you give some insight true. on that? Sure. Uh, bummer of a topic to have to cover, but yeah, you know, I understand people being curious about it. So there's actually multiple systems here. Um, one is the, the first line of defense against particularly Here cheats. we go. Uh, is EAC, and then you know EAC is regularly updated with um, uh, information that allows it to identify people that may be running unauthorized third-party cheats. Uh, that system will just automatically that you know uh, prevent you from playing because we can't allow you into the game if you're using yeah. uh, those third-party uh, cheats. And uh, everybody should understand if you run a third-party cheat, you're going to get banned uh, in New World, and you won't even be allowed into the game. Uh, so that, that is the only aspect of that system that's automatic. There's a completely separate system that we use for okay. sort of enforcement within the game for people. Uh, I've seen a couple of negative comments uh, about the girl that's on here. i just like to remind you guys that if you want to get banned from the chat, a very easy way to get banned from the chat is to make a negative comment like that. Yeah, it, it, it's that easy. I'm not going to make an exception about it. I'm not going to, oh, well, he was trying to be funny. No, just don't do it. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know. Uh, just going to stop this right now. Yep, I've already banned two or three people. What about comments about the guys? I think it depends on the comment, right? Uh, it, it's it, it seems very clear whenever somebody is making a comment that is meant to be disparaging or meant to be banter, in my opinion. And this is my subjective opinion that I will, uh, I, I will enforce this completely subjectively. It's completely my own opinion. Uh, it's not accountable to anyone. I have no real rubric in which I decide this except for the way that I feel whenever I read the comment. And there's nothing you can do about it. So a good solution to that is just don't talk shit about anybody. But if you're going to talk shit, there's a chance that you might get banned. Yeah, I, I, I yep, no accountability. I'm, I'm just going to ban people if I feel like it. And if I don't, I won't. It's that simple. Anyway. Uh, called the ban system. The ban system is a little bit mislabeled because it's also a suspension system. Sometime if you're doing yeah. something and it's negative and it's affecting other players, but it's not really, you know, terrible. It's just just wrong. It's you know like you know like you're, say you're um, bothering somebody you know consistently in game. We need to make you understand that that's something that you can't do. Like you can't harass other players. Mm -hmm. In those cases, we might often just suspend you instead and say like, hey, yeah. that makes get sense. A notice. You know, it's going to tell you why. You know, there will be a period of time that you can't play until you stop this behavior. Uh, it's also possible to have bans that are permanent uh, in the case yeah. of some really egregious negative thing that you do that impacts other players. I, I do want to say that there should be a degree of automatic, uh, automatic like, ban, like a, a, an automatic ban system. But it should not be for anything outside of things that are modifying game files. Like, I'm not talking about, oh, an automatic ban because you said fuck in chat. I'm talking about, like, a Z-axis automatic ban if your character is too high up or too low, under the ground. Uh, these types of things should be an auto ban. 
measure there is the impact to other players. It, you know, that could be the economy. It could be something about gameplay. It could be something that you're doing to basically, you know, like throw a war or create uh, an unfair advantage in a war. Yeah, I'm glad that they're actually punishing people for that because like throwing and like creating unfair advantages, stuff like that, uh, it's like super toxic. It's not good for anybody. And I'm glad that they're actually trying to arbitrate that and deal with it. Uh, I've seen a lot of times that people get banned and then they say they were banned for no reason. Now, as someone who has done ban appeal streams many, many times, listening to somebody tell me that they got banned for no reason, I assume that they're lying. I assume that actually it was completely legitimate and you got banned because you were being a piece of shit. And a lot of times I remember, like, I've seen this before. People will make these threads on, uh, on, the, on the Reddit about how they got banned unfairly. And then someone will call them out in chat. I think that's really funny. There's always a reason. Yeah, there's always a reason. Um, those kind of circumstances affect many other players. And in those cases, we, we are going to ban you. It's a bummer to have to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you're disrupting other people's gameplay to that extent, Live One thing like a bitch, you're going to die like is, a bitch. Uh, and I know there have been reports of this, but I just want to make it clear. We don't it's automatically ban on reports. Right. Reports lead to a human investigating the case, trying to figure out what the impact was, looking at the available data. And if there's a conclusion there, like, yes, you as a player did something that was very negative that affect many other players, you might... See, like, to me, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I know that WoW said the same thing and they were lying. Because uh, you can absolutely get auto banned in WoW, you can one hundred percent get auto banned and, and get chat banned. So I don't know if this is true with New World, but I know it's certainly not true with WoW. And I'm not just going to immediately assume what they're saying is true. To be honest, because I've been lied to before. People have been reporting for P for auto ban as a PvP strat. Yeah, in my opinion, if everybody in the group is spam reporting somebody, I think that anybody who is doing false reports, especially collectively, if I found out a company was doing that and I was Amazon, I would just ban everybody who filed a report, period. Just perma ban them all immediately. Get banned. But that's not something that just happens based on volume of reports or, you know, a particularly, you know, specific report. Mm -hmm. It's always an investigation. There's never an automatic step from a player report to a ban. Right. And a player can go back and try and appeal their ban. Yep. You know, if, if they feel unjustly banned or something like that. Yeah, we take each of those seriously. And, and I completely, like, we, we have reversed in some cases. You know, we yeah. found that, like, we've made mistakes when you have humans. Yeah. Sometimes mistakes are made. Uh, and I completely understand how disruptive that is. And it's uh, like, you know, apologize to anybody that was affected in that way. But it's a necessary step, right? We need, we need to be able to say, yeah, you've done something really bad that, you know, impacts the game. Um, and we also need to listen when you say, I don't think I did the bad thing that you think I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. sometimes there are flaws. Like sometimes there are issues in those kind of systems. Mm -hmm. um, so we do take all that feedback seriously. We investigate every case uh, that, that's appealed. Um, Many players have a different evaluation of their impact, um, and that can sometimes lead to disagreement, right? The right. Yeah, so what he's saying is that some people talking shit causing trouble or delusional, and they pretend like that's not what they're really doing, but it is what they're really doing. You know it, I know it, everybody knows it, and you got your ass banned anyway, and you're going to stay banned, bitch. That's what he's really trying to say. I had to translate that for you guys. I may say... I didn't do anything that affected that company uh, when, I, when I caused them to lose a war. The other company may disagree, and we can look at the game situation and say, yes, we disagree as well. You did do something that right. affected yeah. that other company. So there's not always going to be a perfect uh, resolution there. Yeah. Uh, but we do uh, investigate every appeal. Right. Okay. So how would you, Katie, this question's for you, how would you categorize how serious a penalty is? Yeah, Rich, Rich hit the nail on the head with that one. So it is about player impact. Um, depending on how much a player has violated our code of conduct or terms of use, uh -huh. um, and this is, again, something that 
if it's not part of the, um, the like you used a cheat or something like that, if it's an in-game thing that players have reported, we have somebody who goes and they look at the logs and they check that to see exactly what happened, and then we make a determination from there. Um, so yeah, so it's all it's about player impact. And again, like Yeah, I, I think that makes sense because like if somebody is duping and ruining the entire economy, I think that's way fucking different than if somebody is just doing something to like affect their own character. You see what I'm saying? Like if you're doing something to actually ruin the game for other people, then I think that's way worse than if you're just going for your own personal advantage. But yeah, you just look at the logs, you figure it out, and you go from there. Said sometimes you might not realize what the impact was, mm -hmm. but we do, and we have we use the code of conduct as our guide. Yeah, and and we should emphasize that player impact can be um, sort of abstract. So say hypothetically, you had a way to log in the game and suddenly make yourself level sixty. Yeah, um, and. You might, as a player, say, well, that didn't impact anybody else. Uh, you know, just the fact that I'm level 60 doesn't impact anybody else. Right. But it does because it invalidates the accomplishments yeah. of people who work to get to exactly. the level 60 and earn their way. True. Uh, so in that case, for True. instance, if that hypothetical... I can't wait to use this clip in the future whenever they add experience boosters into the shop. Uh, we, we will save this. So uh, two, uh, 20 minutes into this video. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I will keep this in mind. Were true we would ban you if you if you had knowingly done that if you had done that uh, because you were deliberately trying to yeah. achieve the invalid result we'd say no you you've just invalidated everybody else that got to level 60 and therefore like you're banned right uh, if you if have to by mistake we'll we'll correct the mistake and set you back to level one but luckily there's no way to go from level one to 60 so it's yeah. completely <laughs> but so also far. like you brought up um there are like temporary bans suspensions mm -hmm. and then, like permanent bans so is there like a level of like if you're a repeat offender of you know the same thing does that kind of increase it yes. should yes yeah. it does so our customer support and moderation team they're able to see the history of how often you've been reported of the ban history or suspension history yeah, of course and that is considered so if you keep going back even though we've We've slapped your hand, and mm -hmm. we've told you not to do this. Cut it off. You keep going back and doing that, or you modify the behavior, but you're still violating the code of conduct, then cut, you're going to get a worse and off. worse um, penalty until eventually you're banned. Yeah. yeah. And so the next topic is um, bots. I know people have been talking about bots in our game, and, you know, Scott, this question's uh, probably for you, which is, like, if I report a bot in the game, how long does it take for that report to kind of be a meaningful you know impact 48 days uh, i already know that yep so like katie said uh we we keep track of all those reports like we don't throw those away or anything uh and they're always there to reference um what we want to be careful of is basing any uh like penalty action entirely on reports because uh, I know there, you know, there could be bullshit. things that players can just use reporting as a weapon against other players to ban, you know, the, Somebody the company classic. or wow. another company right before a war or something. Mm -hmm. We don't yeah. do that. And, and um, one of the reasons why it takes a little bit longer to get uh, bots out of the world is because we don't just base it off of reports. We also have to take those uh, reports and then analyze uh, like telemetry and logs and other things to try and... Um, sort of like prove that there is botting behavior going on. And there, there are certain things we look for. Um, you know, there are indicators like thresholds of, of playtime or repeated activity or things that like we very unlikely for a player to do. But even then it's not, yeah. you know, super trivial. Just Yeah, they have basically what they have. This is what I'm kind of assuming that they've got going on is that uh, they have these like thresholds that like if this account is online for more than 21 hours a day more than three days in a row then it's flagged if this account is receiving x amount of resources per hour then it's flagged and then the flagged accounts get sent to a uh, you know a, a reports team and then the reports team looks into probably some sort of coordinates tracking that the account has associated with it and then figures things out and reverse engineers what the player did and decides whether this was just a very efficient player on Adderall or if this is a bot 
Like, that's generally what it is. That's what I'm assuming. Yeah, they got algorithms for that shit. Yeah, it's 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 algorithmic. 100%. That's why I was worried whenever people were trading me a bunch of gold that I was going to get hit by an algorithm. From looking at that information, um, uh, that someone is a bot or isn't. And so... You know, our goal is not to ban players just that are getting reported or players that have a certain play style. You know, there are definitely players that just run around gathering things all the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and it would be, you know, horrible to, to ban them. Like when uh, we were looking at um, gather bots and we accidentally got some folks in companies that their whole job for their company was gathering and crafting. And because they're so good at <laughs> what they do. <laughs> they were. They the were, honest discussion at the angry. table was like, well, no human would ever be no able to hit that, right? No human would do you know? this. And then, and then later we're like, yep, actually, there's a few <laughs> yeah. humans that can do that. So, so, yeah. so, that's so, so, that, so I'm right. That, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so basically, yeah, th they're like, why would any normal human being sign up to be part of a company just to farm hemp? They're like, this, is, this isn't real. And then they find out it is real, and it's like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's reassuring that they recognize that. Yeah, it, it, this is reassuring that they know that, like, that they know what, what's what's real. You know what I mean? Underestimating the DJ and MMO community. Yeah, exactly. One of those instances where where we thought we were making the right call, and then we we heard the reports, we heard the players, and we made adjustments based on that so that we could correctly identify mm -hmm, yeah. the bots instead of the just the really great gatherers. Yeah, <laughs> and, and just to cap that discussion off, I mean, there there are bots like still, me. you know, that uh, like all MMOs, we have bots still in the world. We're never stopping going after yeah. those. And so some people might ask, well, why is this bot, you know, like I've reported it, it's still there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's because we haven't gotten definitive with being able to identify that bot. But in the meantime, we've banned thousands of others mm -hmm. and we will eventually get to that and, and, and eliminate all of the ones that exist now. And then a new wave will come in and we'll never stop mm -hmm. working on that. Yeah. Know? The, uh, the, the player experience seems to be, you know, paramount when it comes to prioritizing what we work on. So how do you prioritize bugs that come in? Um, or, you know, exploit. Well, it's simple how the prioritizing works. If the bug saves players time, it's fixed immediately. If the bug makes things take longer, it doesn't get fixed immediately. Yeah, that's the, that's the way it works, guys. Obviously. It's that, that type of that type of thing so on uh my team what we do is first when we, when we have a report from players or even from our own qa we have qa verify it um and we we create a ticket for it that then goes out to each gameplay team or, or server team or engine team or the appropriate team for for that issue um and then each sub team sort of triages it themselves in terms of priority and a lot of the times we use player impact as uh you know why is it important to fix right now mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's only so much time in the day. There's only so many people on the on the team, and we have a lot of different competing priorities. Um, so we try and, and make sure you know, like exploits and things of that nature are like the highest priority. You know, maybe like a misspelling or something would be a lower priority. Yeah, but even cares? in those cases, different people work on different uh, things. So you know, we could, you know, designers can fix typos or, or data issues. Engineers are working on you know more systemic fixes uh, to things. And it's just a matter of um, bandwidth and, and impact to customer, like what we can get the best ROI on. That makes sense. There's also a component of time. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes little bugs, uh, you know, if they go too long, like we might say like, oh, it's not a very priority. It's just a little, you know, it's a problem in display, for instance, on mm -hmm. a weapon. Uh, and it's got the wrong value on it. And uh, we might say, well, that's... Yeah, you know, like the shield, the tower shield that I got wasn't big enough. Uh, it was a kite shield, and it was supposed to be a tower shield, but it wasn't. It was a kite shield. I got cheated. Absolutely cheated. Yeah, it's not that, it's not that big of a deal compared to, like, the Azoth staff not working, though. Like, this is clearly, this is just the honest, real talk about it. They don't give a fuck about a misspelling. They don't care about, oh, the, the tooltip doesn't look right. It doesn't matter because the game doesn't work, and that's more important than a tooltip.
it's not as big a priority as the other bugs we're working on right now. Yeah. But after it's been on the pile for a while, it actually kind of gets elevated. And we, you know, and so we take deliberate schedule time to deal with the more minor bugs that normally wouldn't be addressed in yeah. a priority scheme, mm -hmm. um, because we know we know having them there persistently is really annoying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not to get too into the weeds there. Um, but no, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Into the weeds. Yeah, people are interested in this, this topic. Um, yeah, so we also have in-game reporting, which is where we determine the impact. So how many players have reported. Yeah. Um, that makes in sense. The, when you go to game and submit feedback and you mm. tell us that there's an issue, um, we use that to determine priority, see like what the impact is there. We also use forums. Um, don't tell anybody, but we use Reddit. <laughs> uh, so, so we listen to players to see what is impacting them because uh -oh. we might think, oh, the number of reports is the impact, and so we might use that. But as we've grown since launch, we've realized that it's not just the number of reports that we get, but it's it's the context of the report. So something might be happening to only a hundred of our players, but for them it's game breaking. Right. That's going to make the top of our list. Mm -hmm. That's going to go all the way to the top. And I know that uh, some things have taken a while for us to address, like uh, the, the folks who can't transfer servers because of a pending or stuck contract. Um, that's something that we are looking at every day. I'm in a meeting where we discuss our top issues, and it is always the first thing that we discuss is where are we at with that. And it's just, it's not a simple problem to solve. Mm. And so that okay. goes back to what Rich is talking about, where there is, there's also this, this component of not just impact, but time, and then also what's necessary. So because of, because of the impact plus the amount of time it's taken, that's why it's made it to the top of our list. Even though the number of players that are impacted is fairly small compared to the rest of our population, so. Okay, okay. awesome. And so, I mean, it's, uh, it can be kind of a dicey thing to find an exploit, right? And you want to report it to us, but you don't want to tell everybody what the exploit is yes. because then it might, you know, Please don't. alter uh, <laughs> alter the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, what is the best way for somebody to uh, report an exploit to us? Yeah. Um, so the best way for reporting is um, right right now we have forums and we have in-game feedback. But if it's something that's like really bad or it's something where you suspect that someone's using an exploit or like a dupe or something like that, you can always message us on the forums. So mm -hmm. anybody who has a dev or community manager tag, you can message them directly. Don't don't post it everywhere. Um, and if there's, because if there's another bug that you want us to fix and you post this live and everybody uses it, well, we're not going to be focusing on that bug anymore. And yeah, because be everybody's doing it. That. that makes sense. So like, we just need to make sure that we're, we're being very careful with the way those are reported. In the meantime, our community managers are doing some cool stuff and some research to see if there's like a shadow forum situation that we mm -hmm. can set up where people can feel safe to, uh -huh. <laughs> to report um, without reports, it yeah. yeah, without it going everywhere. So, so yeah, so there's, there's, op there's options there. You can report in game if you see it and you want to like point out that someone specifically is using it mm -hmm. okay. or where an exploit can be used. When you use that in-game reporting tool, it tells us where you're at, you don't need to provide your location. Um, so if you use that, and you will also see that. It's just that if it needs to be done fast, the forums are the best. I'm in the forums all the time. Yeah, and and we keep an eye on those, like like Katie said. And even if it's just a, a message on the forum, like we take that seriously, and we will prioritize it. If, yes. You know, if if there's a report of a dupe or economy breaking bug or something like that, that will get to the top of the list. Right. E uh, they said the word. <laughs> They said the fucking word. I'm glad. Like, and we don't need to make a YouTube video about <laughs> it because when that happens, then suddenly the everyone's dupe. doing it, or not everyone. Uh, even in those cases, we found that it's, it's actually a very small percentage of the population, but the yeah. impact on everyone becomes huge. huge. And then we have to think about, you know, rollbacks if that's possible, mm -hmm. or, you know, the, we D have word. the economy uh -huh. uh, when, when issues like that were discovered. Um, so it's it's a really big negative if if an exploit like that gets widely uh, distributed. Yeah, let's not shut down wealth <laughs> transfers again. Yeah. yeah, we have less fun than you do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to emphasize, that, so the in-game reporting actually gives us a ton of context. So uh, if you have an opportunity using the in-game uh, reporting for exploits, it tells us where you are, it tells us what's mm -hmm. going on in the world. So it's, it's a good tool. Yeah, probably uh, The other uh, thing that I want to mention is if you're reporting an exploit, and you're not trying to be clever and reporting it after you've used it a hundred times. Right. Um, there are no repercussions to like, I did this once and it happened to me, that seems really uh, odd. 
and reporting it. We don't, you know, like we don't ban people. We, like we actually. Yeah, I did this weird dupe. I got 400 void ore that I sold on the auction house. I figured you guys would know about it. I'm just trying to be a good Samaritan and, uh, you know, make the game better. So, uh, yeah, thought you might want to know. Congratulate and thank them for doing that. Yeah. Um, because that's really valuable information for us. We have had some people. It's like I want to report the thing that I just did uh -huh. uh, uh, twenty times uh, <laughs> that occurred. And uh, now that, that I've made that absolutely it, sure for yeah, the fiftieth time. Yeah. Just to be clear, that does not make it okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the yeah. first time, great. <laughs> Maybe you didn't notice the second time. You know, yeah. okay. Uh, Pass that. Day. Don't don't. don't. You know, don't try to play that game. Yeah. Um, yeah, fuck them. Uh, and uh, exploits also are um, a great thing to play with on the PTR because the PTR doesn't impact yes. the rest of the game from an economy standpoint. Dupe so we on actually the PTR. encourage people, like, if you think something might be an exploit, go and test it on the PTR yeah. Uh, yeah. and then report it to us that way because uh, no harm, no foul. If you're, you know, if you're on the PTR, you're not, you're not really breaking any you know, live server economy, yeah. so it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still, though, if you notice an exploit on the PTR and you're, you're checking it there, still use the hidden pathways, like message us directly, yeah. because if it is something that's happening in the live game, we don't, we don't want to broadcast that. We don't want to have to take the trade post down. Um, again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Again. All right. Well, awesome. Thanks for your time. Uh, we have a lot more coming up uh, to talk about New World, so stick around. Okay. Winter Convergence. This is the new. Uh, this so is this the next new segment. Event. We're going to talk a lot about the Winter Convergence event. So I have with me Mike Willett, the World Experience Lead, Rob Chesney, the Narrative Lead, and Phil Bolus, the Open World Lead. So we got a table full of leads and a lot of questions about the World Experience event. So Mike, just give us you know kind of a high level. What is the Winter Convergence event? Uh, Winter Convergence is a holiday event where we celebrate the celestial binding in Eternum. So uh, during the winter, uh, the lights in the sky start to brighten because of these giant falling meteorites, or we call them gleamites, mm -hmm. that fall to the earth. And it's a, a sign yep. of the forever winter that's coming to Eternum. And uh, I think that's cool. I, I like the idea that there's like meteorites that come down and you can mine the meteorites. Like the idea of it is cool. It, it is it is good. Alongside that, uh, the Winter Wanderer, who's this giant uh, mystical yeti, also appears in winter villages across a tournament, yeah. uh, spreading the word of the, the coming uh, uh, forever winter, mm -hmm. and then saying how we need to bind together to fight back against it. So coming together, bringing war warmth amongst players socially, <laughs> yeah. but then participating in a ton of fun activities for players of all levels. Yes, yeah, so is this something that's going to like kind of repaint the landscape of Eternum, you know, the, the lights in the sky, mm -hmm. or is it going to be kind of uh, centralized into like one space that everyone's going to have to go to? So uh, the winter convergence takes place all across Eternum. You'll see pockets uh, of areas that have been kind of taken over by the forever winter. So there's going to be frozen caves that have frigid folk and bad yetis uh, that you need to go and fight against. Um, you'll see big changes to settlements. You'll see uh, brand new holiday trees that you can go interact with uh, and get presents. Uh, you can also go to the winter villages that are across the turn to, to see the winter wanderer, to get quests from him, uh, to turn in tokens, uh, to uh, get tons of rewards that Phil's going to talk about later. Yeah, so that's the winter wanderer. Everywhere you kind of see this impact into the landscape. So it's, it's a very fun activity that changes kind of like your perception of what happens here. Nice. And it's more stuff that we want to do like this in the future. It's a little bit more dynamic and fun. Sweet. We spare no expense in yeah. the settlements. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you walk into the settlements, you're going to know it's winter. I mean, Frigid Folk is like a great band name also. <laughs> I, I actually think that the uh, the Winter Convergence event, the way that they changed the settlements and they added snow and all, it's actually good. Like it, it's, it's unironically good. <laughs> it's out there. Yeah, it's out there. Uh, yeah, the, we've got the the treatments in, in a lot of the settlements, so it feels like the yeah. holidays upon Eternum. And then we've also got our winter villages, which is, you know, uh, the winter convergence to the max, where yeah. it really feels like you're stepping into a new p part of Eternum. Yeah, it's gonna yeah. It's really cool for players. Yeah, and so, you know, in the open world, maybe you can answer this. Uh, you know, this is the first event that we're mm. bringing to New World. Um, it seems like, you know, winter is just the perfect place to uh, have that setting happen. Yeah, uh, I think 
when you uh, we look at when the game released in September, uh, the time you know leading up to now, I think well, this was the perfect October. moment to to release a, a big event in, in the world, and it, it just coincides really nicely with um, you know the holiday season where where we have an opportunity to come together and spend a little bit more time playing games uh, typically during yep. this time. And so uh, we really wanted to make sure we had some, some of that reflected in the oh, tournament, put our own supernatural spin on I didn't even what know that, that could be and introduce a lot of cool new stuff for players to do during this time. Yeah, because we, we had Halloween come and go, and we had kind of a, a taste of Halloween in a tournament with the pumpkins and things, mm-hmm. so it seems like that on steroids. The only thing I remember about the Halloween event is there were people in, the, in my company, not company, in my server, that bought the Halloween. It was like a witch or something that would go like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and they put it on the very corner next to the auction house. So if you went to go to the auction house, you would hear the <laughs> like every fucking time. It was so annoying. So that's gonna be pretty awesome. <laughs> still, yeah, it's still going on. Yeah. I think there was there, there was like some Christmas junkies on the team too who who've been working <laughs> on this. Like I was shocked to get in and like read the first documentation on the Winter Convergence event because there was, like, people have been working on this for a long time. Nice. Like, some of the earliest plans were years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they really wanted to celebrate those differences that exist on a tournament where it is a jovial time, but it has this, like, eerie sense of darkness and a little bit of dread of, like, you know, yeah, what yeah. could happen. So everything is not as it seems on a tournament. There's always that element of danger. As the narrative lead, um, can you give us like kind of some background in like the lore of the Winter Convergence event or kind of how it came to be? Yeah, and I think um, you know Mike just mentioned that this idea that I mean Eternum is a pretty spooky, dark place. You mm-hmm. know, there's uh, there's the cor- the corrupted and the lost, and I mean there's just threats at every turn. And so from the beginning, you know, we definitely knew we wanted the Winter Convergence event to be something you know happy and joyful, but yet it needs to be inside the the spirit of what a tournament is and what New World is. Okay. Um, so, but I mean, it's also really important for us in in, uh, in New World that you know we're we're looking at cultures from across the world. We're not just trying to look at one culture. So we looked at you know what's consistent in all the different winter festivals across the world. And of course, the solstice is the big the thing. The snow. Um, and so that's, that was the, kind of the start of it, this talk about the convergence and the dualism and the two things coming together. Um, and then we pulled you know, elements from a lot of different places. The Yeti, of course, comes from you know, Asia. The, uh, we have some cri- very familiar Christmas elements to, to some people. And then our, our winter villages kind of are a little bit like a Christmas market. I would say they at least have that vibe, very mm-hmm. European. Very European, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. so you know, we, we took all those elements, and, and in terms of like nice. the, the the backstory inside, yeah, it's nice. You know, what the Winter Wanderer is about is this idea that you know, it, every year this there's this threat of of winter coming, and you know, it's possible that the forever winter would come. It's like a, a winter that would last a really long time, if not forever. <laughs> um, and uh, and the 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 Winter Wanderer is a is a figure that shows up that rallies people to bring happiness and joy and cheer and giving and generosity and community spirit um, to help ward off this this threat that can come. Um, okay. There's also this sort of like, there's a backstory to the character of the Winter Wanderer that we're only hinting at right now. So there's kind of more to come to be revealed about him and like how he became who he is and his relationship to the other Yetis. Super was- cool, really, really cool. But if it's not a cinematic, Miss me with that bullshit. Like, that sounds super cool, but let, let's get some cinematics. Let's get some voice acting in here so we actually know what's going on. Like, I'm not going to read the little blue book that's got a bunch of pages on it that tells you what's going on. Let's get some real story, man. Of course, there's Don't want a wall of text to twit right, longer. So we'll probably see more in the future. Of uh, some exposing some new my yeti and past ways they're all tying in together. So I'm sure you think about that constantly as the narrative lead. Well, yeah, and I think too, like the winter event, like I, I imagine over the years will evolve it. Like we're going to be adding certainly Absolutely. new features to mm-hmm. it and stuff like that. And so the story will evolve a little nice. bit as well. So you'll see, you know, more of the story, but uh, activities will increase. Like right now, uh, a lot of the stuff you do is uh, finding lost presents. Um, crafting things for your territory. It could be like toys and mm-hmm. gifts. 
uh, to, to level up uh, the tree at the center of your town, which will then give you even better presence and rewards. Mm -hmm. So the more activities that you do, the more that builds up that rep, then you also yeah, have an yeah. opportunity to go into the shop and get even better rewards. Nice. Mm -hmm. Great segue, because I have a question for you, Phil. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about the rewards? Like, what can players expect when they jump in and engage with all this winter convergence? You have to farm a lot of presents. And then after you farm the presents, you have to turn the presents into winter uh, tokens. And then you turn the winter tokens into premium winter tokens. And then you buy stuff. Hey. I got a question. When the fuck are you going to do a transmog system? You give us all these cool new items, all these new objects, all these cool things you can get out of the expeditions, and we can't fucking transmog any of it, and we're stuck either using the shitty gear that we have that, by the way, we can't dye our boots or our helmet. Why is that? There's no reason. And on top of that, the only ones that you can change it with are the store objects. Add in a transmog place, man. Yeah, let's get a transmog set. Fine stuff. For sure. Uh, there's a lot to, to discuss here, I think. You can dye everything, also avoid bent? No, you can't. You cannot dye your void bent helmet and you cannot dye your void bent boots. It's already fixed. Test it. You can now. I'm wrong. Thank fucking God. I'm so glad I'm wrong. Wow. Th fuck. F great. Awesome. Um, yeah, we good. really great chalked this event full of unique and exclusive rewards so throughout the uh duration of the event um by doing the activities around the event players can earn tokens and they can use those special event tokens in our winter shop and uh the, through in the shop they'll be able to get exclusive uh furnishings and de decorations for their house including animal ice sculptures which are really neat <laughs> that's yeah that's cool and uh uh, we've got uh, r exclusive new uh, sets of armor as mm -hmm. well as new cool. sets of weapon. They have like a really nice, awesome looking frozen theme. And, so uh, we, and at the top end, we're also giving players um, uh, a skin that is uh, inspired by what the Winter Wanderer is wearing. So it's this nice like fur flowing cloak I like that, that you can get. It's really cool. Nice. Um, I want that. As well as a house pet, which is a, a toy rabbit. and. Yeah, uh, I've seen an that. emote, uh, an exclusive emote themed uh, to the event itself. <laughs> like a frigid, your your cold yes. emote. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you can also get patterns. Cool. And patterns is a, is a new item that we're introducing too in our December release where players can use that. And a pattern is a, uh, a crafting recipe, a one-time use crafting recipe that will uh, emulate the exact appearance of an item, but allows the crafter to craft that at whatever level they're capable of mm. and add in and control their perks with the perk mods and, and, and really control the recipe and, and build their own types of uh, unique armor sets with this specific visual. Um, so uh, those will be available. But what if you get it wrong? Like that sounds like that's a great system. No, it's not. That's dumb. That... I think that's a terrible idea. Buy more? Yeah, like, what if you just want to change one piece of gear? Do you have to go back and recraft the same piece of gear with a different crafting resource? Like, it just seems so weird. Like, why? Like, you already have in the game... Yeah, you, you already have in the game a system that allows you to change the appearance of items because that's literally how it works with any of the store sets. So why why is this even a thing? This is stupid. Just get like, and if you're worried that the appearances are too easy to get, then make it to where you can only get the transmog from like doing a high level dungeon or something like that. It just doesn't make any sense. 
in the uh, winter shop as well as very rare drops from interacting with the tree of light oh, okay that's and cool. so depending on the crafting prowess you'll be able to craft super high gear score uh, versions of the armor and the weapons that you can earn in the shop too so uh, for the crafters out there you're going to want to make sure you got your your uh, crafting gear and your trophies all ready to rock for this event. Nice. It's going to pay off. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's safe to assume that like the things that are happening, the things you get in during the event, they're obviously going to carry over once the event ends. Correct. Uh, yep, everything will carry over. Um, you, you know, the window to earn it is through only through the event, but everything you earn, it's going to stick around and turn them for forever. What would it be if you couldn't keep your Christmas presents? <laughs> right? Yeah, take him away at the end of Christmas. Good point. Forever winner, Rob. Forever no, that's winner. right. Terrible. That's exactly, that's exactly it. Young Greg, when, when he gets his Christmas present, there is a 50% chance that it's broken <laughs> by the end of Christmas Day. Uh, so I, I would usually lose about half of my Christmas presents. Right. <laughs> oh, I thought he was talking about his presents in New World. But yeah, that's good too. Uh, yeah, for sure. Drop him on the floor and we'll expect <laughs> Yeah. Like that's so, why you buy digital presents. I actually thought he was dissing uh, the game, guys. Uh, I was like, damn, they're going to so do Greg, it on more, the stream? One more addition, actually, because there's even more to talk about with the rewards. Yeah. Uh, we're also introducing um, okay. ways that players can increase their expertise uh, in December. Um, and through the event, we're, uh, they do that through crafting a gypsum casts and earning different colors of, of a new material we've introduced called gypsum. And we have a special event gypsum. So by interacting mm. with the Tree of Light, uh, is this a every diamond day, gypsum? Uh, level sixty players can earn um, diamond gypsum. Yeah. And that gypsum, if you interact with three trees, is enough to uh, earn a gypsum orb and craft a, an item that'll uh, be a guaranteed increase to a, an expertise of your choosing. So there's a lot <laughs> yeah. to just uh, dig in here. Also. Sorry, one other thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, go and for wait, it. There's and one wait, more, there's more. more. In the very wow. bottom of the stocking. Right, in the very, very bottom of the stocking. Wow. When you, uh, the first, uh, for all players, when you interact with the Tree of Light in the settlements, you'll get a special lock Bro, box. like, you know what they need to do is, like, make it to where like, the resets happen on the same time every day. Like, I, I, cause, like, I went to go to open up the 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 fucking the the tree to get my presents and i have to wait until later on in the day because they don't have it working until then like it needs to be a, a like at at noon at midnight whatever you want to do it at 10 a.m at 6 a.m something just make it to where it resets it for everyone that way people don't feel like they have to be logged on like let's say you play late one night and you play early the next day well, you can't do anything because you already got all the items and all the all the looting things from last night. It just it sucks. Make it to where it's on the same time. It's eighteen to twenty two hours. Yeah, it sucks. They said they're gonna make daily resets. Oh, I hope they talk about that. That'd be good. Uh, the first three times that you interact with it per day. And that lockbox will have uh, a coin reward and some silver, so that um, it'll be a really good way for players to earn a little extra uh, money, this okay. uh, in-game <laughs> currency, yeah, good. for, for yeah, this uh, season. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it sounds like the Winter Convergence event just like ha is like chock full of you know, new lore and creatures <laughs> and visuals and things that everybody can jump into. So I'm really excited about it. I know um, a lot of the players out there are excited to jump in. So. Thanks for joining us, guys, and uh, giving us a look into the Winter Convergence event. You bet. Yeah. No, thanks. All right. Absolutely. New feature. Okay, this is actually important because this is the part where they wanted to talk about this is what the end game content is going to actually be. Here we go. Okay, and for this next segment, we're going to be talking about a new feature coming to New World. Mutators. And so I'm joined again by Mike, Rob, and Charles. Uh, so if you want to just kick it off, Mike, what are mutators and how do they work? Uh, so mutators are augments to AI, uh, elite AI, and named NI AI in <laughs> expeditions. Yeah. NAI. So uh, they're augments to the AI, and okay. they're on a weekly schedule and cadence, and uh, they go through different rotations, and they're presented as challenges to the player, and they're a great way to test out your gear, your power level, and to increase your power level. So every okay. week you take on a new expedition with a new set of mutations and challenges. 
So you'll go sign up with the board, you go up with your group, you, you enter, you'll, you'll see the challenges before you actually enter. So you'll see what the week's challenges are so you can uh, better equip uh, your gear, uh, okay. your consumables, and prep yourself to, to do several runs. Mm -hmm. um, and so expect to play this upcoming. Um, it's something that uh, we think is gonna be super fun for a lot of our hardcore PVEers right. uh, because every single type of mutation presents a new and unique challenge. So as you're going through it, you might Look, get shocked where certain enemies just start exploding or they start leaving like areas of effect that you need to now navigate around. Uh, and you might. So we have Bursting and Sanguine. Okay, I've seen this before. Yeah, I, yeah, I, all right. Got it. Might be presented with different curses or different things that impact your core abilities that you weren't ready for before. Yeah. So we think it, it adds a unique twist. To They've the got to make sure that, like, if they want to do this, they have to make it fun to play. Like, if the affixes make it not fun, like, you can't use one of your abilities, it, that's not fun. It's just fucking annoying. Like, I, I really, really want to make sure this is so well known that, like, you cannot have just the affixes that just make it shittier. Like you, like, you have to make the affixes make the fights harder and more engaging. Not just some pointless affix that just makes things take longer. Or just makes you play in a certain way. Formula and makes things uh, really challenging New mechanics, and yeah. when you can complete them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, it's taking... You know the the things that you're familiar with, adding the, these mutators on top of it. So it's basically like new content to the game that that you you can understand, and it's just making things different. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, 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 it's 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 a different type of variation of content. So when you're yeah. going into it, yeah, that's true. One way that you expected to play against an enemy is going to change completely by the way that. Okay. Uh, you interact with it. So it'll okay. have different affixes, different types of curses, and, and what we call promotions. And each week there'll be a new combination of those things to challenge yourself. Okay. Well, yeah, and, and you know, I mean, each of our expeditions has a different enemy family in it, right? You've got the corrupted in one, you've got the angry earth in another so one. So there's three and different ones. When you get into the mutators, they're going to behave and, you know, they're going to have bonuses that are different than, than what they normally it. have. So it's going to really change up the whole combat dynamic in each expedition. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. that's accurate. So, yeah, so it's a, it's primarily about expeditions, but what about, uh, like, invasions, not post-rush? Is our Yeah, is anything going like to happen there? Make their way into shaking things up in those? So that's something that we're currently exploring. Uh, and so when we run the PTR that's uh, upcoming in January and we run mutations, we're going to get a lot of great feedback from that, and we're going to see how that applies to going to an even larger scale. Mm, okay. And okay. uh, so are there rewards, are there like, Charles, are there like different rewards that come from doing something that has a mutator on it or mutations? Yes. Yeah, what absolutely. are the rewards? The dungeon, That's one thing that matters a lot. Like, yeah, what the, the fuck is the point of it? The, <laughs> there's a whole new unique like set of rewards for every single expedition that goes with mutators and some <laughs> sort of like rotating rewards as well, depending on what the mutations are. So what are, are they? So we really wanted these like challenges for players to what like they is. feel really rewarding not just in the content itself, but in the visuals that you get from that. So there's a bunch of new unique sets with really cool visuals that I'm super excited for players to see. Great. It'll just like feel like when you've accomplished these different challenges, you can show that off in town. See, like that's all we need. Like if you just add transmog gear for doing the mutations, I will do them. Just give me transmog gear that allows me to think that I'm better than other people. That's all I want. It worked in Mists of Pandaria, and let's not change anything. And, and be able to like really demonstrate your sort of ac accomplishment over these things. Do you have one that's like your favorite? Oh man! It's Again, like, it's like it's picking like, your favorite child. Yeah, I know right? that's that's tough. I think what's most exciting for me is we've been able to take a lot of the like core visual styles from each of these families, the corrupted or the lost, etc., and like really amp them up to a new level mm -hmm. for these outfits for the rewards. I'm gonna see so, it. like there's a lot of really cool unique looks that'll feel different than who, the stuff that's who's gonna give a fuck though if you attach it to a piece of gear that you can't transmog what do i have to keep another set of gear i have to keep my stunting gear that way if i want to go into town go into everfall show everybody else that i got a bigger dick than them 
Uh, I, I can't do that unless I have a certain piece of gear. Like we need, uh, bro, like we need to have the transmog system for this gear. If you want to have these badasses sets, they have to be transmogable. Fucking hate your transmog takes. Yeah, you know what? I fucking hate looking like an idiot. In the game now and, and lets us artistically like, express kind of where we think the game could go right. visually. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I think tying into those rewards, it should be said, like, there's 10 difficulty levels, like, each time that you run one of these mm -hmm. uh, uh, expedition mutations. Okay. Like, for Ten the week. Ten cascading? So what you're trying to do is climb up that ladder, and it's going to oh, yeah, challenge, okay. like, your gear and your level. And so every time... Uh, Every time you pass a certain score threshold, you unlock the next uh, mutation level. And so okay. it starts uh, increasing in difficulty every single time that you jump up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're going to be able to punch above your weight, and other times it's going to become very difficult, and it's going to take a lot more coordination and planning to start to get up towards that level 10 mark. Right. And so we expect uh, players to you know, coordinate well, get their gear in line, um, and every single time that you run it, uh, you're going to get rewards, but you're trying to keep climbing the ladder uh, because the reward pool gets bigger and it gets better and it becomes a, a guaranteed way to increase your power level. Got it. You know what I'm worried about? I'm worried about if they make it to where it's just a... Uh, it's like blighted is like more of a factor or corruption is more of a factor. I feel like the corruption mechanic and the blighted mechanic in New World are completely parasitic game design. They add nothing to the game all they are is just arbitrary difficulty that makes the game more annoying. Like, I, I don't want to see... I, I really hope that's not the direction they go down with these mutators. Is it, is it true that... Aren't, do some of the drops and some of the mutators, aren't they, like, more effective in other ones? Like, okay. do they help you for the other ones? Absolutely. It just depends on what the combination is. Because there's going to be some things where you're going to okay. need more fire resistance. Right. Or you're going to need to do more ice damage. And so, depending on what week it is and what expedition you're running, you're going to have to, you know, adjust to that. And so, yeah, some of those will feed into those other activities, which could be useful in, in other activities that you do, whether it's in PvP or Outpost Rush or, mm -hmm. or any of the other game modes. Because okay. you're like, oh, this person is wearing this type of gear. I'm going to challenge that by, you know, equipping stuff that's, like, maybe more heavy and elemental or right, avoid right. damage. Okay, I think I, I think I grok mutators yeah. now. But you mentioned keys. Is there like a if they like kind of grind to get these keys? So having resistance sets. This is pretty much what they're trying to do. They're trying to force people into having resistance sets by adding what I am assuming to be damage modifiers that do that type of damage. So it's like you have to have fire resistance because the mobs are now doing fire damage. I am not sold that that is a good design because there are so many different ways in New World that you can completely avoid damage. Uh, not only as a tank, but as a DPS player as well. Uh, for example, the amount of iframes that dodging gives you for the amount of uh, times that you can block big attacks, even as a tank. It, it's. I'm not sure if this is going to work. And I think that if they just added like a pa like imagine like a passive damage that's always dealing damage to your characters, I think that would be terrible as well. In my opinion, what they should do if they want to do these mutators, give the bosses and the trash mobs more mechanics, make them play differently, adding in ice damage. Oh, now they're vulnerable to ice, or now they can only take ice damage. This is not, in my opinion, game design. This is just, okay, this is another, it's another box you have to check that you need to do before you go into the dungeon. This will not translate into fulfilling gameplay. Another micromanage, yeah. It's lazy. I'm worried that's what will happen. So, un unlike our vanilla expeditions, the keys here are universal. So once you have a mutation key, you can use it in any mutation. And because we want players to run these more frequently, they're going to be more freely available. And so during the PTR, we're going to figure out, you know, hey, what is like the right amount of, that you should be carrying at any given time? 
and and where we think players are going to be like climbing the ladder. So we'll mm -hmm. make adjustments in tuning based off of that. But our goal is to have this is is repeatable like every day. Yeah. Yeah. Some world yeah, content. Yeah. yeah, they need to. Uh, awesome. Multiple times every day. Actually. Yeah, and so you cool. you were just touching on like when we might see this. Right. Well, uh, January. <laughs> January. Yeah, yeah you'll see it on really VTR soon. in January, and then I it's coming up soon. The release. It kind of depends on. Uh, a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, obviously jumping into the PTR for everybody out there is like intrinsically valuable for us, right? So jump into the PTR, give us feedback on, you know. Why is there still body blocking in expeditions? Why? It, 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 it sucks to play. If you wanna make harder dungeons, just take body blocking out of expeditions take it out of pve entirely i have never had a point playing this game for over a thousand hours collectively through the betas and the alpha and the preview event and the live game i have put a thousand hours into this game and i can tell you for a fact that not a single time has body blocking as a pve player made my experience anything but worse it is trash just take it out of expeditions. All of these new features, things you discover. Um, but yeah, we need to say it's public test realm. I think we do. Some yeah, people. PTR, the public, the public test, test realm. realm. <laughs> yes, yes. And what was AI again? Uh, artificial intelligence. Got it. Yeah. Got it. But see, I think that's confusing to people too, because like some people, I think, well, the gamers mostly know that AI is enemies. But NPCs. Yes. We have our, well, our, our whole post. It's an yeah, object yeah, that's been scripted to do things. <laughs> yes. To hurt you. Yes, based on what you do. Yeah. <laughs> so I think of NPCs as being good guys. Like, uh, it comes from a quest and a narrative guy. So. Ah, yeah. That's because yeah. you tell the NPC what to say. That's right. I mean, yeah, but they're, they're nice. Like Someone said it makes movement important. I, I want to understand. I want to drill this down. There is literally zero value in body blocking in PvE. Here, I'll give you an example. If you went into a dungeon and you had to turn your monitor off to do the dungeon, it would mean that you had to understand the layout of the dungeon way better. Just because there is a perceived positive from a change does not mean that the change is good. It's trash. Realism, it's not realistic if you take your weapon off and you can walk through people like you're a ghost. There's no realism or immersion to that at all. Body blocking sucks in expeditions. It plays like shit. Tanks getting pushed around constantly by multiple mobs hitting them, getting stun locked. It's horrible. <laughs> Bad AI. That's because you're a nice person. They're not. Well, I, I think that too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, play in the PTR. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, we're going to have the rotations accelerated so you can participate in more and see how high up the ladder you can climb. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Thanks, guys. I uh, think everyone's going to be really excited about the mutators and uh, how they're going to change I'm excited. the game. Balance and tuning. Okay, here we go. All right, so for this next segment, we are going to be talking about kind of our February release, how we're focusing on balancing the game uh, a little bit more. We are joined by Dave Hall, who is the player experience lead. So, Dave, kind of at a high level, how do you Dave, determine you been doing, whether man? a weapon might be overpowered? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, tools that we use on this. We look at the forums. We obviously have our internal play test. We have our expert players. We also look at how the wars and uh, outpost rush modes are going and what weapons are being used. For instance, in a war, if you know 40 out of the 50 people are using an ice gauntlet, there's probably a reason they're <laughs> trying to use right. the ice gauntlet. <laughs> right, right. So we need to kind of look into that and what is being done to, what, what are they doing to Good. Uh, cause this OPness, as we like to say. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, it goes into a lot of different things. And in the end, it comes down to, for me, <laughs> is this experience that's happening to the other players still bad? <laughs> Right, like, if, is what this ice gauntlet doing to the other team yep. something they can't counteract? Is it something they don't like?
to play against? Is it making the game experience worse? And do they feel bad that they're not using that weapon? Mm -hmm. And do they want to switch now to go to that weapon? Um, yeah. you know, those are things that really start to hone us in on like, hey, this might be something wrong with this weapon and let's take a closer look. I like how he's using the, the ice gauntlet as like a hypothetical, but the real reason is that it's the great ax. Like I, I heard that like almost everybody in Outpost Rush uses great axes. Now, I haven't done it a lot, so I'm not really sure, but that's what I've heard a lot. And on the reverse side, right, we, we we're talking about overpowered weapons. Uh, you know, there's there's players who are talking about the, great the fire staff and maybe the ice gauntlet being underpowered. Do you do you agree or? I think they're in a really close place. Mm -hmm. um, there was some pretty significant uh, changes to them recently, um, and I know those weren't super well received, but uh, they're they're a little, lot closer to the other weapons than they used to be. Um, we are looking at a few things in the very near future that are going to amp them up just a little more, uh, in particular for the fire staff. We're Good. looking at the fire mage side of the tree mm -hmm. to do some little bit buffs in there. And the ice gauntlet, we're making sure to add a little more CC in because we act, think we accidentally nerfed a little too far in their CC abilities. Right. So. Now, do, when uh, we're going to use the PTR for a lot of this, right? Like, hopefully, these things will be discovered on internal play tests, you know, through the QA team and what have you. But was it super well received? Yeah, I wonder what Dave plays. Yeah, uh, maybe he. Uh, yeah, what does he play? It will say great axe. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. He plays great axe and hammer. Yeah, no wonder his hair's not gray. He's been playing the great axe the whole time. He's been having fun. If this dude was playing with the fire staff or the ice gauntlet, his hair would be gray just like all the rest of them. That's what happened. You see? You know, when something goes, to, a big change goes to the PTR, uh, we'll be looking for player feedback, you know, about overpowered or underpowered weapons. Um, how do you take that feedback and ingest it, you know, to make changes? Yeah, it, we have to do it very quickly, first of all. And so we take a lot of the feedback and we, we actually sit in all day meetings, all the combat designers, and we just sit around and we talk about everything in there and we raise everything up to the top that we think is the highest priority. Uh, we look at the feasibility of the change. Uh, how long do we think it will take? Is it an mm -hmm. easy change? Is it just a data change? Or is it a complete rework of the ability? Those obviously will affect how we're going to approach the, the uh, issues that people are seeing. Mm -hmm. So uh, this could be for you, Scott. Someone said the bow users are starting to look like the rug on the table. <laughs> Man, that's some, <laughs> that's some fucked up shit. Um, when you decide to implement uh, like a new perk uh, instead of balancing, or I mean, it could be for anybody, uh, when you implement a new perk instead of balancing the old ones, um, is there a science or a, a method to that? Um, no. I think part of it is uh, just our team capacity no. and who's working on different high priority things. You know, if there's a lot of high priority bugs, then. We might have more or less engineering support on a particular thing, <laughs> and more designers able to address things. So part of it comes down to um, you know who's able to do the work in in sort of the time frame we need. Um, in some cases, it means that we already have the tech and, and we can make new changes or even adjust existing things depending on on a case by case basis. Um, but that's probably the biggest thing, sort of like who. Uh, like what resources can we commit to yeah. to fixing a particular thing? Yeah, I think that um, instead instead of saying instead, uh, mm -hmm. like why did we focus on creating new ones versus this? It's not a versus. These things happen at the same time, right. and so there is a resource part of this, which is if we don't have the the resource that is supposed to be working on the new content, if they're if they're needed on fixing old ones, that's where we're going to put them. We're going to put them on the fixing. Mm -hmm. But mo I think like one thing. One of the subtexts in this entire conversation is the fact that think about how many times they placed emphasis on the fact that they need to prioritize certain things. I think that really emphasizes the idea that they're probably being overworked and they're understaffed and they can't solve problems fast enough. Most of the time, we can work on both of these things at the same time. It's just fixes aren't always easy, right? Um, and so it's going to seem like we're 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 focusing on new content or new perks, 
versus doing bug fixes, but we're not. These things mm -hmm. are happening at the same time. It's just the level at which we can get them complete. Yeah. That's what changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And some, <coughs> sorry, sometimes you'll see uh, people, you know, in the forums or on Reddit or, you know, what have you saying, like, why not just buff all of the weapons until they're the same level instead of nerfing particular ones? Yeah. Nerfs all the content. Uh, great, you can't do that. Question. I think uh, that works in Diablo with our they, weapons. They scale it up uh, infinitely. We do want them all to be around the same level, obviously. And, and for a lot of our updates, we have been buffing unused abilities or upgrades that aren't getting usage. Uh, but some of the overpowered ones, we just had to bring back down into a mm -hmm. little bit of a tighter control, because otherwise, it just kind of escalates uh, to a point where, at some point, none of the enemies will be tough for you anymore, right? Like they're just. And who like, wants that? Yeah. You want <laughs> who a wants bit of none of the enemies <laughs> being tough? You want challenge in the game. Yeah. And I yeah. Think so we want to try to keep it in a bracketed uh, place, and uh, and I think with anything that's not being used, we're always looking at. I do take some concern with how they define things being tough or things being hard, because, for example, like there are NPCs in the game that are just way harder than the other NPCs in the game, like the Thorpe guys in Merkblood or uh, Merkguard, for example. They're so tough that nobody kills them. That's bad. Like, if you want to have things that are harder, great. But if you want things that are harder, they have to get better rewards. And if you don't have things that give better rewards, but they're harder, players are going to be pissed off and they're going to skip them. Oh, you got nerfed to the patch? I'll go try it later on. How can we make them better for the player? We want diversity in our builds. We don't want everybody using the same tree. We don't want everybody using the same three abilities. So we want to make sure that's occurring for all our weapons. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like this is a, you know, an ever-evolving process yeah. um, where we collect feedback from the, the players, test, iterate, um, that it's, it's uh, going to continue to happen. It's not just like one thing's going to end it all. Absolutely. We're going to be doing this for the entirety of the project. A really good example of hard mobs are the NPCs in Timeless Isle. You guys remember that? Because each one of the different NPCs would have different abilities that would do a huge amount of damage if you didn't avoid it. But their base attack damage was very low. So every NPC that you were fighting against was more of a skill level and a skill check rather than just a damage check. And I think one important thing to remember is that this is the beginning of the, the lifespan. And in the beginning, there are a lot of little shifts that kind of need to happen. This mm -hmm. is the first time we've had so many people playing. Growing this, pains. Yeah. A little bit of growing there. And so there's been some larger changes than we would like to normally do. Mm -hmm. um, but they, seem, they had to be do, done. And so I think we're getting to a place where the changes will be a little more subtle. Right. Uh, and a little easier for people yeah. to uh, yeah. understand. And in terms of growing pains, I know that some people are complaining about uh, bots in Outpost Rush. Mm -hmm. Scott, do you have any info on that? Um, yeah, so uh, that's definitely a concern. Um, Outpost Rush is like one of the you know most engaging uh, like level sixty uh, experiences that players can engage in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. so when there's a bot or like an AFK player or, or someone just taking up a slot to to try and grind rewards, um, that that really hurts you know one side of the it's other. It's a cock and ass to uh, everyone. On. And so we're doing a lot of different things um, in that regard. We're uh, doing an, uh, analytics and telemetry to try and identify players. We shortened uh, the AFK thresholds for Apple Rush because that's supposed to be like that's good. an active um, yeah. type of uh, experience. Uh, we're also changing the scoring system um, a little bit. Uh, this is announced in the uh, December patch notes. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to make it so that the assist kill contribution works a little bit differently than it does in the open world. In the open world, you know, you want to favor the player and you know if someone's in your group and you kill something you want them to still get experience and loot and all that kind of stuff yeah right. but in outpost rush we sort of put you into these groups during during the game mode and then it wasn't it didn't really jive with with uh like our vision for that mode that you know you'd be off to one side not engaging in pvp and then you'd be getting all these assists and that was one of the things that was contributing to the score and allowing these bots to basically do nothing but still get you know, a chest reward. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we're, we're, that makes we're approaching it from a lot of different angles. Okay. That, that's actually, yeah, that's, that's smart. And speaking of patch notes, Katie, I know this is something that comes up uh, a lot in the community. Um, when 
they feel like there's something that has been left out of the patch notes that it might have been done intentionally. Can you talk a little bit about how the team puts together patch notes? Yeah, sure. So first of all, going to throw ourselves under the bus a little bit that we never intentionally miss <laughs> items from the patch notes. Um, but I don't know about that one, Katie. I don't know about that one. I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that one a cap, man. How is it that all of the things that were bad get omitted? It's it's just too convenient. It it's just too fucking convenient, man. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think I am. I mean, everything's bad if you think it's bad. You're right. Pizza's bad because if you eat it, you can get fat. And if you get fat, you could die. You're right. Pizza's terrible. Shut up, idiot. Everybody knows what we're talking about. There's a lot of changes. And the difference between what we did uh, in alpha and beta and what we're doing now um, is... We're providing more structure and we're really focusing on how to get the best out of our patch notes and ensure that we haven't missed anything. But it's been a really tough process mm -hmm. because, for instance, when we when we do a monthly release, that first set of changes that we start looking at, there's tens of thousands of them. Right. And sometimes it's it's difficult to keep track of those. So we're constantly looking for ways to do better with that. But I just want to make it very clear that there's not there's not an instance that we are like, mm, let's just leave that off. Mm -hmm. Let's not tell the players about this one. That doesn't help us. We want to tell players like what has changed, yeah. what's new in the build, what's different, yeah. because we want you to go in and give us feedback. That's a critical piece of our development cycle is getting player feedback. And if there's something that we want to call your attention to, we're going to do it, and unfortunately, we've had some misses in the past, for sure. And uh, all the changes that, that go into our game, like there's a variety of them, like art changes, you know, there's tweaks of different numbers and variables, then there's like more systemic like code changes and, and changes to systems. And so even for one particular player-facing change, like to, to modify mm -hmm. like the fast travel system or something, you know, there might be six different check-ins that all change one thing, or there might be like one change that, that actually modifies like 12 things that the player will see. So translating like the, the changes that are the team members are making mm -hmm. into like a bullet point list of like this is what the player will see uh, can be challenging. And then also the w I've had to I'm catching up here just banning people that are making rude comments. Give me a minute, guys. Okay, I think we got pretty much all of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, one rude comment is a permaban. Literally just just one one comment. That's it. And it's completely I want to make this emphasize this again. This is completely subjective. I might read your comment and think it's not that bad, not permaban you. But maybe I'll read it and I'll be like, ah, this guy's a dick and I permaban you. It's completely subjective. There's no rules to it at all. There's no accountability whatsoever. I am the judge, jury, and executioner. And that's all there is to it. The way we sometimes rely on, like, maybe engineers or other people that are very focused on on their work and like I'm changing this number from you know X to Y, but they don't understand the player. Impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a there's yeah. a lot yeah. of player impact. Then I'm like you know alter the loot rolls of every single chest in the game, yeah. right? Right, right. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of uh, work that there's, we can do. Yeah, it's that not. Workflow. It may seem like it's um it's a simple thing, um, but it's it is very complex right. and. Uh, my dad always said that complex problems have simple, easy to understand, wrong solutions. <laughs> and that's where we have definitively landed with the patch notes. But it is something that we're working I, I feel like 
actually a lot of simple solutions work a lot. I, I would disagree with that. I, I think that simple solutions usually work really, really well. Like, I, I think people, they all the time, they'll intellectualize and overthink things. And then the reality is that it's so much simpler than what people make it out to be. Now, I think that also, uh, I'm not going to get into that too much. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. But yeah, I, I think that some complex problems actually do have very simple solutions. Working on it, we're trying right. to do better. Um, we want to make ourselves like, mm -hmm. like the gold standard of this. And we're falling short of that at this time. So That's it's, true. It's, a, it's a priority Thank for you. my team in particular. Awesome. Thank you. That's I'm glad yeah, to. It sounds like I'm you glad know, to hear that. Right now, January, February is really all about uh, f fixing process, um, the the balancing of things in the game, mm -hmm. the continued mm -hmm. polish, bug fixes, things like that. Um, so it sounds like we have a lot of really like maybe not crazy flashy things happening yeah. right now, but like under the hood, um, in really important things. Yeah. Definitely, for uh, sure. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for uh, joining us on this segment, and uh, we will have more coming up next. Great. New, oh, oh, here we go, great sword, let's hear it. All right, so this Come next on. segment is gonna be all about weapons in New World, and both of these gentlemen are heavily involved in how the weapons work, okay. adding new weapons, tweaking the weapons we currently have. Um, so this question will be for you, Dave. Huh? Um, you know, what do you think about when you are coming up with a new weapon or what n weapon should be introduced next? Uh, there's a couple things. I think first, uh, we always want to introduce weapons that bring new play styles to the game, right? Like, so something that really changes up the gameplay. Uh, like with the Void Gauntlet, our most recently introduced weapon, uh, we really wanted to bring in this idea of debuffing uh, and sort of a counter to some healing and debuffing as a different play style. So mm. definitely look in with each weapon to bring in something new that changes up gameplay. Uh, the second thing we look at is sort of trying to fill gaps, right? Like, what about the coolness factor of having a really big two-ended sword? Because it would be cool if we had a really big two-ended sword. Like, that would be really cool. And, and like, you could do, like, an AoE, like, Whirlwind with it. Uh, you, you could do, like, a, a like a jump forward with, like, hitting them with a sword. Uh, it, 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 like, it would be really cool if we had a really big two-handed sword. And it would do like crazy AOE damage and just like insane single target damage. It would have like really good gap closers. It would just be like really good at pretty much everything. And it would have lifesteal built into it as well. Uh, like that's that's what we need. We heard loud and clear from healers. Hey, what do I use with my life staff? Uh, and I think the Void Staff, sorry, the Void Gauntlet was like yeah. a compliment to that. Yeah, like those I agree with that. It was really smart well to do together, that. So mm -hmm. Also just trying to fill gaps like that. Okay, and speaking of like uh, weapons kind of pairing together, can you talk about the blunderbuss and how it might be different? Um, this is a new weapon. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. Uh, yeah. So the blunderbuss, uh, a really exciting new weapon will be coming out with yeah. pretty soon here. Um, and it's uh, awesome. When you think of the musket, it's a little more of a strategic weapon. It's a longer range, a little lower uh, rate of fire, all those type of things. But when you get to the blunderbuss, you're going to think more excitement, more explosion, like a, shotgun? a little more chaotic. I would call it. There's some uh, navigational tools on it, which are really exciting, uh, and a little more of a run and gun style. So, a definite difference in pace for this one in comparison to the musket. And it's going to be a little more short to mid range, and also it makes it's going to pair really, really nicely with some melee weapons. So, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe even some staffs. So, it's going to be an interesting. I think that would be cool. Uh, that has a lot of uh, different uses. Yeah. Is okay. that a hint on what it scales based on? Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that yet. <laughs> All right. Speaking of uh, weapons that are heavily requested and talked about by the community, the greatsword. Can you tell me anything about it? Uh, we are working on a greatsword. I think <laughs> okay. we've heard it. I think it's going to be an awesome weapon. Uh, we talked about wanting to change up gameplay with each weapon. I uh, yep. don't want to give away too much yet about the greatsword, yep. but I think it'll have this concept All of right. stance switching and like having different modes mm. within the weapon that I think will be really special and bring something new to the table. Fuck okay. yes, I mean, dude. That, that sounds great because people are knocking down our doors for okay. that game. Okay, here's what you need to do. Play BDO, play a warrior in BDO, then take everything that the sword has in BDO and put it in, in New World. That's it. 
and then read a little bit of Berserk, look at a few like really cool scenes, and then just add that into the game too. Yep, it's super easy. Just dupe it. Straight up fucking dupe it. A great sword. Uh, another thing people are, are also asking a lot about is daggers. Is that something, yeah, dual uh, wielding. something coming down the road or? Yeah, daggers are definitely a crowd favorite. Um, we have a lot of different weapons on our table that we're looking at to, to make after uh, the great sword. And I think it's definitely at the table. Um, I don't think it's, it's a big table. It's a, it's yeah. a pretty large table uh, with a lot of different weapons on it. And I think it's one that is near the front, but it's not, it's not quite there yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take that as an answer. <laughs> um, and another, uh, one of the last questions that, that we see just asked constantly is, when can I use a shield and another single-handed Hatchet. Weapon? Uh, that one hasn't made the table yet. And oh, I just want to be... Uh, you know the pro no, the reason why it hasn't made the table is because the sword skill tree is fucking garbage. All the sword abilities suck dick. They're trash abilities, and they're not fun to use. So, the swords, this is why, like, if they ever added this into the game, why the fuck would anybody use a sword again if they could use a hatchet? Hatchet plays a thousand times better, it does way more fucking damage, the abilities fit together way better, who the fuck would use a sword? Fix the sword tree, and then you won't need to worry about people using it with a hatchet. You know, the problem, really, I think this is the problem, is that uh, it's for PvP. Like, if you had a hatchet and a shield in PvP, I can pretty much assume that you would fuck people's shit up. That one's still outside, that knocking on the it's, door. It's trying to get a seat at the table, and it's it's something we really want to do, uh, but it is a, it's actually a really large endeavor for us to, to, get, to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. And we want to focus on, on filling in the other play spaces with the other weapons first before yeah. we go over to that um, area. Okay, all right. So it's knocking on the door, it's but, uh, but we hear the feedback. Yes. Yeah, and I think we wouldn't do... I really want to emphasize that the great sword has to be really big. Like, it, it really has to be big. Like, you can have, like, other skins that are smaller. Like, yeah, sure. But it really, it, like, it has to be, in my opinion, comparatively to the player, right? Like, it's assumed the player is, like, five feet tall. The great sword should, between, should be between five to seven feet tall. It should be big and thick. It's very important that we have that. Like, it's going to take us a while to really build out a system where you yeah. can flexibly interchange weapons like that. But, like, creating another weapon that does pair with the shield, sort of like sword and shield, like mm -hmm. making a specific pairing, yeah. is something that, you know, uh, is not on the table yet, so to speak, but, <laughs> right. but could be sooner. Okay. It would be on the table you if have swords a, didn't suck. Do you have a favorite weapon pairing, or has it changed since, you know, well, since you started designing the game a while ago? I was a, a big great, great Axe uh, hammer sword user, so... Yeah. Uh, but that, that recently the meta is shifting a little bit, which yeah. is cool in a game. So, uh, looking for my new pairing now. Yeah, I used to uh, I always run sword, uh, sword and shield, and great axe, and uh, added in the warhammer. Guys, I think we figured out why great axes are so good. I think we figured it out. Yeah, uh, everybody was wondering why are these great axes just so dominant. Why are they so good? What is it about these great axes? Why won't the devs fix the great axe situation? And what a surprise, the two guys here that don't have completely fucking gray hair are the ones playing the most meta weapon. Look, he's ha look, he's happy talk look, he's happy thinking about it, talking about it. I mean, come on and great axe and now i'm actually doing warhammer and uh arrow just i just like the bow and arrow now so. we watch like a, a ton of streams you know a lot of content creators um we play in game with all these folks has there been yeah. anything that like surprised you in the way people are pairing weapons or kind of their you know their build maybe not a pairing but one of the things that i loved was some of the creative uses of the ice gauntlet like the, the sneak up PVP moves, like we see people hiding behind a bush and like 
see a big PvP mob grow in, and then they like jump out of the bush and put Blizzard and all. Yeah, these that on is really to, like, cool to watch. The whole group. That's badass. That was super cool to see. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I really enjoyed was people just playing around and making their own paladin build. That was something we actually had not oh, really geez. thought about when we were making. He's not these, still uh, here in chat, is he? Our weapons and everything, and. When we first saw it, I was like, this is amazing. So. Uh, it might have been a little overpowered for the people playing against it. <laughs> so we might have made a little changes there. But overall, we just loved yeah, it. Yeah, they had the, um, there was like this, like, full heavy armor set. And you would use the life gauntlet and you would full heal, like, every three seconds or something like that. It was... <laughs> Let me see. Can I find the clip real quick? Let me see if I can find it. No, that's not it. Let me see if I can. I, I've got to pull this up, man. Where is it? I'll show you what it was like. Um. Yeah. So this was the game. This was the gameplay of the Paladin build. See, he's going for it, and the guy just full heals over and over and over. It doesn't matter how many shots he gets. It doesn't make a difference. Watch, see? Full healing over and over and over. I'm going to skip ahead. It's just the same thing happens over and over. This is old? Yeah, I know. I just wanted to show you guys how OP it was. Look at his look at his health. He's going up to full health like every few seconds. Look at his face. He's so upset. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the best part of any New World video I've ever seen. Watch this. He's talking shit. Run, chicken, run. Oh, get fucked, Gary. Ah, uh, get fucked, Gary. <laughs> get fucked, Gary. That's why I tried to look it up. Just that one by itself. Yeah, this video is fucking amazing. I love it. You must be embarrassed. Yeah, I know. Get fucked, Gary. So yeah, the Paladin builds were really, really, really OP. The fact that people can kind of go in there and make their own class, I think that's just an amazing thing. Yeah, I mean, what's been really cool, like having worked on New World for so long, like the game now belongs to everybody else, right? And we're kind of just witnessing how they're engaging with it. Uh, before it's been, you know, kind of theory crafting and wondering how people are going to use the game at scale. So it's, it's fascinating to watch. Um, uh, and I think that's going to motivate, you know, future uh, tweaks and balances and, and improvements. Yeah, for sure. I love, like, checking the web and, like, finding better builds yeah. right. uh, for weapons that I've worked on. It's like, wow, they, they thought of something I didn't. So he's a metagamer. It's amazing. I love watching the streamers and especially the PvP streamers and watching how, they, uh, how their new tactics are evolving every day. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, next, we are going to be talking about endgame content. Okay. Thank God. This is actually, this is one of the big L's for New World right now. Is like the endgame progression loop is pretty fucking bad. So in this next segment, uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about endgame content. We have Dave and Phil both here to Hi. talk about this. Um, I think one of the big things that the community is asking about and is kind of a hot topic right now is why what? did you decide to remove the high watermark system? Uh, well, I, I think there were some improvements we wanted. Because it sucked dick and it was bad and nobody liked it and it wasn't fun and it wasn't any content. It was just doing the same thing over again. I don't know whoever thought that was a good idea in the first place, but they're crazy. Good call getting rid of it to make is how it would classify it. And I think the, the two big things I think of is one, 
Uh, the high watermark system was completely random, so players had no control over it. Uh, and with the Super gypsum fun. system, players can do activities and then get gypsum and choose which cast yeah. they craft, right? So That's if good. you want to increase your sword, uh, you can do that. You have some control Big over it. And that's good. really important because sometimes you just get unlucky with rolls. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. have a weapon or a piece of gear you really want to advance, uh, not being able to could be you know, sort of devastating. So that was one big Sucks thing. The other thing is we just wanted more variety of activities, mm -hmm. right? Like with the old system, it really rewarded uh, named enemies, right? And almost too much. It was too inefficient of a path. And so everyone just did that and they missed all this other. It's actually a really good point. I, I completely. The fact that he's saying that is good. Uh, like, I'm so fucking glad that he's saying that because what he's acknowledging here is that how systems force gameplay. Yeah, the system forced gameplay too hard in one direction. Cool end game content we have. Uh, so with the different gypsums, all the different activities, uh, you know, you have incentives to do everything. You yeah. can do corrupted breaches, you know, you can do all the different activities, expeditions, arenas, which I think is, is some of the most fun and difficult content in the game that no one's really doing. So we really wanted to, to bring people to all the content we have. You want to know why nobody does arenas? Is because it's a fucking 10 minute thing that you have to run all the way over there for. You know what you need to do? Make it to where one person goes to the arena who has the orb, and then they summon everybody inside where the orb is. Do you think I'm going to run my fat ass all the way up through the Reekwater Elites for 20 minutes and then risk dying? Lose durability on my inventory items for no fucking reason just so I can do an 8-minute boss fight that gives me a chest with a green item? Are you insane? I don't want to have to run around. The arenas are cool. Running to them, the, the time that it takes you to run to the arena is like two or three times as long as it would take to just do the boss. Sure. On, on top of that, too, uh, I, mean, I think it's worth noting settlement? that we're no longer That'd calling cool. it the high watermark system. We're calling it expertise because mm. that's really what it is. You're raising your level of expertise on each. Uh, that's good. The high watermark system was a stupid idea to even call it that in the first place because you can have a low watermark. How can you have a low watermark in a high watermark system? It doesn't make any fucking sense. So, yeah. Great. Been or type of item that's uh, that you can equip in the game, and uh, another big thing too that we've done to help give it a lot more structure. And one of the, I think the the big misses that we had when we initially rolled it out is it's invisible to players. Mm. So now when you go into your paper doll, um, yeah, you can see you know what is your big level good. of expertise per every item big that you good. have equipped. Also, big good. Um, when you do get a bump now in your expertise. You get a nice notification that pops up on the screen, this big, beautiful yeah, banner. Yeah, it pats you on the back and it tells you you're a good boy. That's good. Like it, this, is, this is good, 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 good. This is very, very good. I'm glad about this. It feels good different on the PTR. Unironically, in this case. Right. That lets you know just what you got and, and what mm -hmm. it affected, and it feels it feels great. I love it now. It, like you almost after did you it. Um, loot a, in a chest or, or kill an uh, expedition boss, and you get like that item that raises your expertise up, you get this nice toast, and it just that's feels like you just got stronger. It's really cool now. Nice, that's great. Um, there's another question that keeps kind of arising: is uh, why downscaling gear instead of raising the gear score to a new cap? That's a terrible idea. Anybody that wanted that is stupid because people have spent two months farming their gear and invalidating everybody's gear two months into release and putting everybody on a new wavelength is a terrible idea. Who the fuck was asking that? Ban them. That's a good question. No, um, it's not. Well, when, when we looked at players' progression along the uh, expertise system, we, we did see that very, very few people had actually maxed out their expertise. And we wanted to address that portion before even, you know, 
attempting to raise the gear score. Mm. So with our the yeah. gypsum system and surfacing the expertise now to players, we're giving, as Dave mentioned, a lot more control to players to start to grow and progress on that path and have it feel more tangible to them as they do it. The other thing too is when we do raise our gear score, we want to attach that to some good meaty content. We don't just Yeah, not yeah, a big meaty dick of content. Exactly. How the fuck is New World getting more dev interaction than WoW? Think about that. Think about how many times uh, the New World devs have come out and tried to talk to the player base and the community about the game. Uh, no, nah, it's it's true. Like they have been doing a good job because it's a new game. So you think that like as time goes on that they're just like not going to care? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't predict that. I hope that's not what happens. But I mean, I, I could see that happening. Sure. Uh, see, like, in my opinion, I don't really think that's the case because they know that, like, they can always bring out an expansion or something and it will bring people back into the game because it's Amazon and they have, like, you know, a lot of money to market the game. At least I, I think that they do. I mean, they marketed New World a lot on Twitch. I think that's a big reason why people played it a lot. So, it, it, I, I mean, like, regardless of the reason, I guess, I'm still happy it's happening. I just want to raise it just because you know if that makes sure. sense yeah we want to make idea. sure that there's a reason that you need to get to you know above 600 gear score now mm -hmm. to go attack some larger threats in the game yeah how do you uh how do you see these changes uh affecting crafters uh yeah i think what we want for crafters is for them to be able to participate but in their own way right like we don't want to have to force them into activities mm -hmm. uh and what crafters most want to do is craft right like they love gathering the materials and then uh, you know, developing their skills, the trophies, the potions, their gear set to really maximize crafting. Uh, so what we want to do is give them a, a path towards that. So uh, any crafted gear will never be downscaled or affected by expertise. So it's an alternative path to get towards end game gear. Because mm -hmm. we know these people invest a lot of time and effort in getting that. So mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my stream had to, to give me so path. much stuff. Yeah, and make sure that still feels rewarding. Another thing we're doing By too, the way, um, I am going to be doing another begging stream on New World kind of soon. So just be ready for that, guys. We just, we're adding a new reward type as well into, okay. a, along in, uh, with the system. And uh, as players uh, battle in these, our, our end game zones, they can acquire uh, a new type of item called a timeless shard. And, and these will be either armor or weapon shards. And when they're crafted, what, what they'll provide, they basically act as an artifact recipe. So it's a one-time use craft, but with that craft, players will have a guaranteed attribute. So you mm -hmm. get a, a timeless bow shard, as an example, that would have a fixed deck, uh, fixed dexterity mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> attribute. And then you can also control uh, what perk you put on that with, our, with the perk mods during crafting. So there's a lot more control that those items are gonna give crafters Okay. Uh, in pursuit of that perfect rolled item. Right. Yeah. And are those pretty rare, Phil? Can you sell them when you get them? Uh, they are pretty rare. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, you know, if you, you, you run the elite zones enough and you're doing the end game content, you should come across, uh, come across them frequently enough. And um, uh, can you sell them? Uh, yeah, yeah of course you can. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> what I like about our crafting system is that anyone can engage in it if they want, but we also don't force it, right? Like, yeah. So what's cool is like if I'm not a crafter and I get one of these timeless shards, mm -hmm. it's sort of like hitting a little mini jackpot, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. I know I can go yeah. uh, to the trading post and sell this thing to a crafter who's really going to want it. Right? Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, That's so, good. Uh, going back to the gypsums a little bit, uh, why aren't all gypsums the same? And why does it take more time to create something with one type of gypsum over another? That's a good question. So uh, the different activities uh, that Dave mentioned and doing things like uh, running expeditions, opening elite chests, killing uh, uh, bosses or elite named enemies, right? Mm -hmm. um, part participating in Outpost Rush, uh, a lot of different um, in, in crafting and he didn't know i i think that either he didn't know but there's also another good chance that he wanted to check with the other dev if it was okay to say it publicly that's what i think it was i i i don't i don't know that's that's what i think checking for approval yeah because like this guy 
I think this guy, like the other guy is the creative director, so he's probably the one that's more in charge. Uh, uh, closing max level uh, corruption breaches in the right. world. Um, all these things will give you different colors of gypsum. Mm -hmm. um, and then the recipes, uh, they require different amounts of gypsum because, you know, some of those activities are much more easy to accomplish than others. Right. So, you, you know, you might have to open... Um, uh, you know, three elite, you know, have to get a good roll out of three elite chests versus like getting a good roll off of uh, killing more elite named enemies or things like that. Mm. Um, and then, uh, and you know, things like uh, Expedition and Outpost Rush that take a little bit longer of your time would, uh, you'd have, you'd have to do less of those to be able to craft right. uh, a gypsum cast. Okay. That would make sense. And we got that uh, makes sense. a super interesting eighth gypsum that we recently added with the Winter Convergence event. It's a diamond one. Uh, we wanted to just keep increasing the rewards based we, on feedback we saw in the PTR and also give something mm -hmm. for end game players to do. So mm. we've now introduced Diamond Gypsum into the Winter Convergence event. And so that'll be an eighth way you can get a cast, which I think people will really enjoy. Nice. So there are people who think that expeditions aren't worth their time <gasps> and effort uh, and they're just not doing them. Mm -hmm. It's a pain in the dick to make the tuning orbs, man. That's it. It's just fucking annoying. But yeah, that's selling for 10k on an orb. Like, wh why? Like, who wants to do that? That's a lot of fucking money. 5k a person on my server? It's like 2k on my server. If anybody wants to invite me onto doing, uh, please invite me to your runs for Genesis. Or Lazarus. I'm a god. I do a lot of damage. Do you agree? Well, uh, no, I think there really is some, some truth to that to, to a level. And, yeah. and we've been working hard to try to address a lot of that. True. Um, with this update, I think that expeditions become a really great source for uh, leveling your expertise. Uh, in an expedition, you get a guarantee. Yeah, but how about the sources for getting the expedition keys in the first place? Because you're right. That's why it's made them cost double. random expertise uh, drop when you defeat a dun uh, an expedition boss. Mm -hmm. you're, you're also going to be opening elite chests, which have the uh, possibility to uh, reward you with obsidian gypsum. And uh, you also uh, get a specific gypsum from doing the expedition itself. So um, if you're completing these dungeon runs, that gives you almost you know three opportunities per the time invested in that, dungeon, uh, that expedition run mm -hmm. to, uh, to increase your expertise. So pretty rewarding. And timeless shards will really come from expeditions, right? That's one yep. of the main sources. That's one of the also. main sources for timeless, uh, yeah, weapon and item shards for sure. Nice. You know, earlier in the show, we talked a lot about the mutators. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you see the mutators affecting the end game? Uh, a lot. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Phil said, you know, we don't want to increase gear score until we have new meaningful content that brings uh, hard challenges, and I'm sure. As Mike said, mutators are hard, like really <laughs> hard. Uh, so this is going to be a time where we increase the gear score because you're going to need it to deal with the mm -hmm. difficulty 10 mutators. Uh, so we're not going too much in the details yet, but as okay. you do mutators, you're going to be getting uh, a new resource that you can use to upgrade specific weapons. And, and you'll need to sort of do that as you're ranking up in the difficulty chain. Oh, wow. So like you actually don't even get the items themselves. You get an item that upgrades your item. I think that's better because that way you don't have to re like if you get a really good legendary from Lazarus like for example I have the weapon masters I, I have the legendary weapon masters axe from Lazarus like imagining me like myself imagining myself farming that again it's like oh no so I, I, don't, I don't know I'll have to see how the system turns out mutators you'll have to keep increasing your gear. Oh, content will be useful, sort of otherwise it wouldn't be. Yeah, it's a good weapons. way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's, that sounds awesome. I'm Chasing really excited your about rolls, I like that, yeah. it, They're going to be great. I'm super excited. I'm really excited for our players to like just get in there and, and start feeling the power. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just really palpable now when you get in there and you start uh, earning your expertise bumps and you start getting those good rolls and 
crafting your gypsum, like it all feels really rewarding. So I'm, I'm really excited for people to experience it. All right, great. Thanks for sitting down and uh, talking about Endgame with us. And uh, we'll move on to the next segment. Quests and lore. Okay, here we go. So this right, segment so should be like five seconds long. So we've got the box quest, we've got the kill quest, and then we've got the kill and loot box quest. Okay. Um, so now what? Yeah, I, I'm really curious to see what they're going to say here. This next segment, uh, we're going to be really diving into quests and lore within New World. So we got Mike back, Rob, and Charles in the seats. Um, so this one might be for you, Rob. There have been some changes to the main story quest since launch. Uh, are we planning to continue that trend? Absolutely. Yeah. So we're getting, uh, we're working on our quest tools all the time, and we're improving like what we can do in quests, the way we implement quests, like to make them more fun, more impactful. Um, and so we've been prototyping all of our new tech in in the main story, and we're adding these even to, to cinematic uh, quests that are already live. So. Uh, destructible, you know, objects that you can destroy That's as cool. part of a quest. Uh, new sort of traversal puzzles in some of the main story That's quests. That's cool. Um, and wave event encounters, which is something we didn't have before. That's so cool. all those are going into the main story quest. And then, you know, of course, we're also going to be uh, finishing up this chapter, uh, this first chapter of the main story soon. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's pretty exciting. Definitely a lot of work going into that. And uh, yeah, we're going to continue like you know possibly updating these quests when we find ways to do it, or we see that like hey, players aren't as engaged with these quests as we yeah. like them to be. It sounds like um, you know early on people were complaining that quests can be too repetitive and True. some parts of the world don't actually ha like have enough quests in them. It sounds True. like these are some of the answers to that uh, that line of thought. Well, yeah, because I mean, yeah, we're we're continuing to add new quests, so we're we're. In addition to the main story, we're adding new quests to some of the territories. We're putting NPCs like out in Great. the wild with new storylines, and you know, and, and new dynamics, frankly, that we didn't have in the game before. This um, is we're good. We're also working on you know some some new quest lines that are associated with trade skills and weapon skills. Mm -hmm. Like super excited to because yeah. those like I think bring a different flavor to the experience that they'll run throughout. You know, so one our, of the other problems with this shit though is that it just takes forever to do anything. Like, it, it takes forever to to go through and do a quest because you have to run all the way back. Like, the, a, a big problem with the whole thing is that you have to spend so much time moving back and forth. Moving back and forth. Like, travel time is just too high. Here's what they need to do. They need to make it to where whenever you finish a quest in a quest chain... That as soon as you finish the quest out in the open world, the next part starts. You you get your quest in town, you run out there, you do your quest, and running back to town to get the next part so you have to run back again is just too much time investment. It's just too much it, it's it's just too much dead dead time. And they have that with the weapon quests. So this isn't impossible. There's no, there's like, oh, you can't do it. It's not immersion. Like they do it with the weapon quests. You already do it. Then you go through content too quickly. Good. Early At least you're going through it. To the end. Yeah. And then kind of touch on what Rob was talking about with uh, some of the updates to the quests. Uh, Charles and I have been working really closely with our zone teams to ensure like we're updating the art and POI. So like you'll start to see more of the themes of like corruption uh, and and like a withered lost and bile and, and just different elements start to tell more of the environmental story uh, that's helping, you know, uh, accentuate and and uplift a lot of the stories that they're trying to tell mm -hmm. on the lore side. So whether it's the inter interactions and sometimes we've wholesale moved POIs and, and rebuilt things in order to tell better parts of the story. Yeah, a lot of that yeah, is they've like done the presentation that presentation of some of those events too, making sure that like this narrative was there, but we weren't really highlighting it, and so now like making sure it's getting the love it needs to like express that narrative in a good way. Yeah, nice. So some players have uh, expressed frustration with the quest flow and the travel times to get between quests. See, he's watching how are we, the stream, uh, addressing stuff like that. That's Mike. good. So uh, we're taking like a multi-pronged approach to addressing a lot of those things. So uh, first thing uh, you notice, and I believe this was in the November release as you run faster on roads. So mm. 
that's another little boost that you get to players that are just trapped. It's, it's a terrible way to do it, man. Like, because if you have... One direction, this is point A, and this is point B. Okay? And if the road goes like this, and then the outdoor area, you can just go like this. Which one's faster? Even if this one right here is 10% faster, it's still going to be slower overall. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's still going to be slower. The, the row, less mobs? Who gives a shit? It's 10%. Yeah, it, this is going to be way faster regardless. So I, I think that the, oh, the road makes you run faster is, is just dumb. Like, I think they should add it. Like, I'm not saying they should add it. But, like, this is not a solution to the problem. This is just a added quality of life that makes using roads more, more relevant, which is good. But the problem is more fundamental than that. Going along all the normal pathways. Yeah, even 20% would on. be good enough. Uh, right. Second thing is uh, we're starting to add some additional spirit shrines closer to some expeditions. That's so once unlocked, you're going to be able to get to certain expeditions a lot faster than you previously had been before. Additionally, we're cutting out the modifier for distance traveled. Reducing uh, so that, reducing the cost mm -hmm. uh, for, di for distance specifically uh, for uh, fast traveling from... A settlement to shrine or vice versa so that cost will get reduced so you'll be saving a lot more azoth um and then uh, what was the last one Rob? We're, we're also revealing them on the map ahead of time so you can see yeah, where they good. are oh, okay. they're doing the spirit that. shrines i mean yeah. before you could you could follow the column in the sky but this kind of makes it a little it's bit a easier start. You to identify them on the map and then head over there to unlock it and hopefully make yourself good. make it easier to get around the world and then additionally with a lot of the new quests that we're doing we're having the uh, the NPC uh, like follow along with you. So a lot oh, of times okay. you're, it's going to be uh, shorter distances traveled, and then also you're going to have turn-ins in the next sequence of quests uh, closer by for a lot of the new content that we're exploring. So nice. exactly what the I NPCs wanted. NPCs out near the great the, idea. the situation they're going to send you to instead of their way back in the settlement sending you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and you can way. see some of that with yeah, uh, the great idea. Nights. They're yeah. watching the and stream. That, like adds to like the dynamic feel of the world. You're going out and like. Oh, coming across these other adventures and sort of having these little experiences that feel more natural. Yeah. So going back to the lore and the narrative, um, what so is it? far it feels like Eternum has a lot more questions than answers. <laughs> uh, even as we, you know, are going to start to wrap up storylines, is the the mystery. Bro, like y'all cannot have a blue book as the lore in the game. Like that's just like nobody's going to sit there and read it. It's like you have to read a twit longer every time you go to a new point of interest. Like, oh my god, I, I, <laughs> what is this? Like the lore doesn't have to be bad. It could be cool, but they need to make it more accessible behind Eternum going to remain, you know, a through line uh, as we go forward? Yeah, I mean, definitely the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the fact that this island is this mysterious source of legend and myth for all the world's cultures is kind of the core idea of what it is. Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, there's, there's folk stories and, and, you know, superstitions that are associated with this. And, and you know, that's, a, that's something we want to play with for, for the life of the product. Yeah, and I think it's, good. you know, it's something that uh, I guess I, I, what I want to mention is that there's another aspect with the enemy families, um, with the corrupted and the lost and the angry earth, where the dynamics between those and the history and how they relate to the ancients, you know, one of the big mysteries about right. how, who the ancients were and where they came from and where they went. Um, there's a lot of story there that we want to reveal over time, um, but we've charted it out and it's something that, uh, that yeah, we're super excited to explore. Cool. So it, it does sound like we're going to kind of uh, wrap up Isabella's tale, maybe Thorpe's tale. Uh, are there going to be new major characters coming in uh, to the mix? Definitely. The um, and and yeah, is, we haven't seen the last of them. Yeah, they're okay. iconic characters. So right. you know, we'll you know, even when we wrap up this chapter of the main story, 
they're not iconic because people don't know who they are. Uh, the thing is, like, yeah, they are iconic in the scope of the game, but they're not iconic because nobody really knows who they are. Like, for example, the first necklace I think you get is, like, Isabella's necklace. Why do you have that? Like, the, the one constitution necklace, like, why is that? Most people recognize Thorpe? No, they recognize the New World guy. They don't recognize Thorpe. They recognize the New World guy. Okay? Let's keep that in mind. You know, rest assured, those 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 guys are going to be back. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll be introducing new characters, too. Um, we've definitely, you know, I think, been brainstorming a lot on, like, different kinds of characters and, you know, historical people and uh, and other sort of mythological figures that we could bring into the story going forward. So, cool. I'm excited about awesome. That yeah. I was going to say, for me, like, the aesthetically and narratively, like, digging into this history, looking at myths and legends from all these other cultures, there's so much, like, interesting story to tell in it ties into our setting really nicely sort of brings a lot of like different culture and visual variety and like the kinds of stories we can tell are very different as we go area to area and as we add new zones so i think that's pretty exciting that's I, cool. was, I like this aspect where we're in this place where nothing really dies and on a long enough timeline who's really good who's really evil and do those roles you know, change over millennia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very interesting to see that dynamic and how it plays out in different situations yeah so you, you were touching on, you know, bringing in new cultures and uh, kind of the, the art style of that. And I know your impetus has a lot of the how the biomes look and how players travel within those things. Um, Why are people confused about that? That seems, uh, it seems kind of easy to understand. Yeah, that, that seems easy to understand. There's nothing, nothing crazy about that at all. Um, do those things intersect, like the the art and the uh, how players move through the space? Um, are they they're connected extremely close? Ab absolutely, you can't have one without the other. I mean, you have visual storytelling and and the the needs of the player, and then I, they're not too different than I guess how humans react with things, like how we observe something, we speculate about it, and then we engage with it. And so you want things to feel like they're rooted mm -hmm. and they're familiar, yet they're, they're different in a way that's uh, intriguing and engaging. And, and we look for those opportunities to you know, create uh, some of those juxtapositions right. and, and make you think and, and put you at wonder. I mean, some of the vistas that Charles and his team have created are you know, gorgeous. Right. True. So it's like we want to keep building True. upon like, uh, you know, the structure that they've already laid down. Mm -hmm. Totally. Oh, add, like, every time we're thinking about a new space or a new area or a new zone, it's definitely something we've been talking about a lot is like, what's the core dynamics here? How can the environment like change the way you approach a space? So players have to like sort of alter their mindset like, oh, I'm in this zone, so I need to deal with and think about these things that I didn't have to think about in that other zone because this environment's different. There's something different here that I kind of have to contend with. I think okay. we want to lean into that more, more environmental stuff that just affects how you approach the game and sort of what you're doing in that zone. Yeah, definitely want to take advantage of the the growing set of utilities that we're giving the player and how that interacts with the the, the places that we create. And okay. I, I mean, I, the, you know, some of the new spaces we're working on are pretty dramatically different from what you've seen in the game <laughs> so far. Right. Like, not just in terms of like uh, the way they look, but in the dynamics that you're talking about and like the stories that we're telling in them. Um, and then we're also really working hard, uh, I think, in all of our different disciplines on creating more discoverable stuff, like things mm. that the players just happen on to, whether that's, a, you know, a character, a quest, or like a little mystery that's in, embedded in the environment. Um, like a lot more of that stuff is, is getting added, I think, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, it's like, I'm, I'm super that's excited fine. to see more players <laughs> finding that stuff. Like they found the, um, you know, the ship the ghost ship that appeared off the coast. That was really uh, cool. I remember seeing a video of that. Like that. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like there's a ton of exciting stuff to look forward to uh, for the players, both from a narrative perspective, from a world zone perspective, you know, new enemy types coming in. Um, so you'll see all of that in the future. And um, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll all check it out together. Okay, cool. That 
was a haul. We got through a lot. And uh, I just want to say thank you to anyone and everyone that made it to the end of this video. Uh, you know, all of these questions we pulled from the forums, from social, they all came from the community. So I really hope that you found it uh, informative. Yeah, it's and good. that some of the things you were wondering about, um, you now have answers to. And we gave you a little bit of a look at what's coming in the future, what we're doing behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, we, we just appreciate the feedback. We, uh, we are so excited to answer questions and do this. As a matter of fact, if we hear from the community that, that this was beneficial and you like this, we'll be happy to do it again. Mm -hmm. Yes, do it yeah. again. I did want to comment that we also heard you loud and clear that you wanted to see the devs do a run through Merc Guard. We did it. <laughs> we'll be releasing it in a few days. Um, How'd you do? How'd you do? So we were way under geared. Uh -huh. so, so it's going to be here an hour 509. Here it should have been around 570. And my disclaimer is our PEX lead was in Tampa Bay watching Buffalo. So uh, this is going to be, oh my God, I cannot wait to watch that video. Holy fuck. Like how long do y'all think that video is going to be? I mean, it's got to be like 45 minutes, like an hour and a half or something like that. Like three hours. Yeah. Oh man, I cannot wait. But I do want to say, uh, just before the video ends and everything, that I'm really glad that they did do this. Uh, whether you uh, like or don't like the game or whatever, I think you can recognize that uh, it's good and important and meaningful and productive that you have the devs sit down with the player base and actually level with them. Talk about, say the word duping. Uh, talk about like the the negatives the positives the planning for the game uh yeah it feels good different exactly <laughs> and it's 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 a good thing though it actually is a good thing i'm glad yeah i i, I think this is better than not uh Class. Feels good, different, close but game, so we, had, we lost our best player but we held in there a little bit so we'll, we'll let you all judge how we did yeah yeah the world will get to judge all right thank you very much everyone for joining us thanks bye yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I think this is a, it was a good video. And shout out to Greg and everybody in the New World team who put it together. Yeah, I, I, I think this is, this is great. Uh, hopefully they keep doing more videos like this. I'll keep getting more content. And we're all winning. And no, yeah, and nobody disliked the video either. That's crazy. Wow. Can you believe that? No dislikes at all. Yeah, I think a lot of people are being uh, being positive with this overall. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's always a, it's always a good thing, and uh, I'm happy about it.